The following podcast is brought to you by Combo Cleaner. Use the offer code MOORESLAW80 for 80% off Combo Cleaner. And then also use the offer code Broken Silicon for 10% off Vite Ramen or for 25% off Microsoft Keys at cdkeyoffer.com. And we'll talk about these sponsors more later. But for now, let's just go on with the show. Welcome to Broken Silicon, a gaming hardware podcast. I am your host, Tom, and today I am joined by my co-host, Dan. Dan, how are you doing? I'm pretty good. How are you? I I, I was just telling you this uh, as I uh, was getting on the call, went Microsoft Stealth upgrade, quote unquote, upgraded me to Windows 11, so that's exciting. Now, let me look this up. Windows 11 Stealth. Uh, like is this something that you also looked into uh, no i, I haven't yeah, looked into it but i did not agree to the i didn't get like the little notification like do you want to upgrade to windows 11 i just restarted my computer and i was on windows 11 when i turned it on yeah i'm looking well, around I, I must and have hit the update and restart instead of just restart but I, i'm looking around and it's not hard to find posts of people saying the same thing has happened to them. So uh, this further backs you up that to any of the comments going, you did this one dumb thing, which again, I guess I don't know. I, Maybe sure there's I something probably, you clicked, you know, I pro- I, I'm sure I clicked the wrong button when I clicked restart, but I, <laughs> normally when it tells you to go to windows 11, it like prompts you and there's like a not right now thing. I didn't click upgrade to windows 11 on accident or anything. I just restarted my computer 20 minutes ago and I was on Windows 11. Well, I guess uh, if anything goes wrong with this recording, we will be instantly blaming Windows 11 and uh, and Phil Spencer specifically because he's in Phil charge Spencer. of all of Microsoft. Well, we're not saying this. <laughs> Phil Spencer actually came out of that closet behind you and put a gun up to your head and said, you will use Windows 11 and you will get Game Pass. That was the weirdest thing too, is that right when you rebooted, it made you play a Game Pass game as well. Yeah, and I always thought it was, I mean, I, I thought it was kind of weird because he's just the head of uh, Xbox, but I guess Phil Spencer is ride or die Microsoft. And he also knows where you live and thinks it's worth forcing you to do it. But yeah, this is... You know, well, maybe you'll call the cops after this. There will be an assault charge, but he got he got some guerrilla marketing into a podcast episode, so why not? <laughs> well, I mean, the plan was for them to uh, sigh up everyone here uh, because as I slowly start to tell you that I really like Windows 11 and how it makes me the center because everything's in the center now for no reason. It'd be funny if uh, we could get... Someone who works for the Moore's Law said team to just like have Phil Spencer, like an animated Phil Spencer, hand you a dollar every time you mention <laughs> Windows 12. Like, you'd, like we could just animate him coming in that door and like putting a dollar on the desk and walking out. And then, <laughs> I mean, who's to say, you know, in 10 years, podcasts will be able to do those jokes, I bet, where you can just have it be nearly photorealistic and we can just, anytime we mention any company, have some face of the company come in and pretend they're paying us. Well, I mean, there are some like live streamers that are pretty impressive at quickly inserting graphics and stuff into their <laughs> into their stream. So I bet we're we're almost there already. Yeah. Now, will after we're done recording in ten years, in the middle of the night for an episode, will me and Gerard have the energy to do that? That that is the real question. <laughs> and when I Probably say energy, not. yes, an extra. We got a solid episode, well edited, the audio has been mastered, and then we're like, are we now actually going to spend five minutes adding this joke? That'll be the real question. And the answer is, maybe, who knows? (laughs) The answer is, how soon did we finish recording, and do we have the energy? Um, Falto writes in, and he says, why does Tom have a Chad like Jim? It's easier to render. I mean, I, I do think people need to remember, we've talked about this before, Tom is an AI construct. It's just me talking to myself. Yeah, yeah. Which which tells you how tired we are at the end of this record these recordings. If as an AI construct, I cannot add in AI animations myself. 
Yeah, I just created a chat GPT model of Tom, and that's what this has been the entire time. The entire time. And in fact, it wasn't until well into the channel being created that you appeared on it. It's exactly. all been a master plan. Um, all right. Well, speaking of master plans, it's hard to see why this would be part of any master plan, but it looks like it might be for Intel with story number one. Intel i9-14900KS seems to be greenlit with massive power draw and potential delitting support. All right. Quoting first from Tech Power Up and then adding some editorialization for myself. According to a leak out of HKEPC, Intel's upcoming limited edition desktop processor for overclockers and enthusiasts, the Core i9-14900KS, comes with a gargantuan 409-watt maximum package power draw at stock speed with its PL2 power limit unlocked. And that is, of course, all there to facilitate the chip hitting its maximum 6.2 gigahertz P core and 4.5 gigahertz E core boost clocks for as long as possible. And that's not all. This channel also leaked that the i9 14900 KS is indeed seemingly greenlit despite prior concerns from within Intel that they shouldn't even bother launching this because if it tops the charts, it would just be a Pyrrhic victory if it's using two to three times the power of the competition. And well, I don't know. Seems like that is probably happening. Although from the people I've talked to, not everyone's convinced it's going to be coming out immediately, but I guess I can't say for sure either way. But what I can also say is that it sounds like, at least from one of my contacts, that delitting support is being considered as some sort of officially supported thing for this product as well. Again, not 100% sure they'll go forward with that, but the fact that they're even considering it to me is crazy. Uh, so while some details still seem a bit foggy, this thing does seem to be coming and possibly coming within a few months with some truly extreme features to match its extreme. Power draw. All right, Dan, what do you think about the i9 14900KS? Uh, I mean, it's the long line of KS uh, CPUs that highlight the bad part uh, parts of Intel's uh, CPUs or really barely know when over what it would have had to begin with. So what, a 3% boost in, in Best performance? Best case maybe? scenario, you know, I guess the one thing... Let me check this. I9 14900K. The one thing I'm curious about is like, what's the boost clock here for the E cores on this thing? 4.4. So yeah, it's still a five, a one, a 100 megahertz increase for the E cores. Like I was like, if it's like a 10 percent increase in that, maybe it's multi-threading would be somewhat higher. But yeah, I don't know. I think you're looking at a three to five percent ideal scenario multi-threading uplift, and in single threading again. One to three percent, I guess. Yeah, that's what you're looking at with this thing. I mean, if they could really do something crazy and get this like half a gigahertz higher than the K. Oh, if it was 6.5 gigahertz from six and they managed to do it without really raising power, even though it's already so high, I don't know if that's a great accomplishment, it would be somewhat interesting. Yeah, I, then I would say release it. But as, with 200 megahertz bump, it's just what so you're going to be instead of playing in 1080p at 100 at 200 uh frame uh fps you're going to now be at 204 or something it's just uh, it's just yeah. not worth it and all it does it serves is to highlight the bat the insane power usage that the their cpus have by going even more extreme with it so I, the first KS, I think, kind of made sense. Like, what was it, the 9900 KS, or there was one before it, maybe. But yeah. everything since then has just been dumb, and especially since they've moved on to their uh, big little architectures, has only made their CPUs look worse. Yeah, I'm try I think it's just kind of gotten more absurd every time they've released a KS. Like, if I look here... Yeah, I mean, like a... Two to four percent performance increase in gaming, multi-threading went up sometimes by five percent, and power consumption went up by like 20, 30 percent. I mean, but again, that was back when their power consumption was, of course, not as good as AMD is usually oftentimes, but still not that insane. I just feel like it's gotten more extreme every time, and this is continuing the trend. Like you could almost see why you'd get the 9900 KS before if you're a collector. Now it just it, it that is all it is. You're you're trying to you're paying for the best yields. Anything outside of that is, I mean, I mean to say it's not worth it is well beyond overstating it. It's it's beyond not worth it. Yeah, it, it's this just does nothing. And every review for this, like I I don't even know what's going on behind closed doors. If this is actually mm. 
what's happening because you know, like uh, Gamers Nexus will probably review it, and uh, uh, maybe Hardware Unbox will also review it because I'm sure, and I'm sure the execs watch their videos to see what they say. Oh yeah, they do. And it's like, the, how does this not come up in conversation? Is so American and Australian Steve are both going to just say this thing doesn't isn't functionally any better than the 14900K, but it uses more energy. That's they know that's going to be the conclusion of both reviews. So all they're doing is putting out a bad ad, uh, a bad week of advertising um, <laughs> for something that will barely exist because these are always limited products anyways. It's just it, all it does is highlight the bad parts of Intel's uh, of Intel's uh, architectures and doesn't improve anything. It's just I, I just don't get how they can keep putting out things that push pow, uh, power draw more and more because that's seemingly all they do. And they don't realize somehow that that looks bad for them optically. I, I mean, honestly, well said. You pretty much covered <laughs> anything I would have thought of saying here about it. I mean, I, I think let's just move on, actually. You know, <laughs> okay. I, I don't think I have anything else to say. All right. So let us move on to story number two. Intel confirms nodes leaked by Moore's Law is dead and their plans to become a foundry first company, or it seems like it at least, going from Tom's ha- hardware. Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger held a question and answer session today at the company's IFS Direct Connect 2024 event. And in response to a question from Tom's hardware, Pat reiterated that Intel is willing to build chips for anyone, including longtime rival AMD. Quoting here, Pat. Intel will now offer its process nodes to some of its competitors, and there may be situations wherein your product teams are competing directly with competitors that are enabled by your crown jewels. And this is when someone asks, how do you plan to navigate those types of situations? Maybe soothe ruffled feathers on your product teams. That goes, well, if you go back to to the picture I showed today, Paul, there are Intel products, and then there's Intel Foundry. There's a clean line between those, and as I said on the last earnings call, if they set up separate We'll have set up a separate legal entity for Intel Foundry this year, and we'll start posting separate financials associated with that going forward. When the Foundry team's objective is simple, fill the fabs. Deliver to the broadest set of customers on the planet. We hope that includes Jensen, Cristiano from Qualcomm, and Sundar from Google. And you heard today, it includes Satya from Microsoft. And I even hope that includes Lisa going forward. I mean, we want to be the foundry for the world. And if we're going to be the Western foundry at scale, we can't be discriminating about what's participating in that. So unequivocally, it is to be the foundry for the world, commit supply chains and leadership technology. The doors, to the a la carte menu are wide open for the industry. In the same event, Intel also showed off Clearwater Forest, the still just 288 core successor to 288 core Sierra Forest that utilizes hybrid bonding and Intel 3 base die and Intel 18A top die. And uh, by the way, that 18A node was stated as being the node to regain leadership over TSMC at that event as well. They also confirmed the 14A node this channel leaked to be used by Nova Lake much time ago. So there you go, Dan. Uh, Quite a lot here put into one story. I don't know if you have any thoughts specifically on any of that. I mean, honestly, statements like that are some of the... They don't give me confidence in their uh, design teams uh, for their architectures, but it gives me more confidence in Intel as a company. Mm -hmm. Because uh, they're never going to full out, or Pat Gelsinger would never full out, come out and say, like, our design teams are lagging and not doing well right now. But he's saying, well... We're f- basically two companies, and at least this half of our company is doing well. And mm-hmm. th- that means putting our uh, competitors' uh, architectures on our nodes, that's fine. Which, you have to remember, they're competitors, kind of, but they're ultimately all just trying to make money. So if they can make money by manufacturing something for AMD, I don't know why they would Or NVIDIA, or anyone, <laughs> or NVIDIA, really. Yeah. But they're... they're well, no, they are competitors with NVIDIA, but they they have a, with their uh, chips, they're a lot more direct competitors with AMD because let's be honest, their GPU wing, and wing isn't exactly uh, competitive. <laughs> I know, but, you know, I got to say though, if you're NVIDIA, I, I could see them considering using, and you know, I've, I've of course leaked years ago that they were considering using Intel to a certain extent for some of their graphics cards to fill up fabs that maybe they could get a sweetheart deal on so that their most expensive 
TSMC stuff isn't as directly competing with their ability to make cheaper graphics cards for gamers. I could see that in the future. And I've even been told, you know, I, th- I don't remember when this was. It was last year at some point by someone at NVIDIA that they would love to make the integrated graphics tiles for Intel, which I'm going to be honest with you. I mean, I, that would make me more likely to buy an Intel APU laptop if like, instead of Meteor Lake, like imagine if right now, instead of Meteor Lake having integrated Alchemist Plus graphics, it has in- an integrated thing that's like the equivalent of an RTX 4060 laptop edition. Yeah, I mean, that would make me way more likely to buy an Intel laptop. It's just the person at NVIDIA, this was last year at least, as of last year, told me, they would want to know that Intel is done making discrete graphics for gamers, have proof of it somehow, and know that also even their integrated stuff is a full gen or two behind NVIDIA so that undoubtedly when they have to share NVIDIA's roadmaps with Intel, they're not giving them any leg up on beating sense. them to market on something, you know? Yeah, I mean, that makes sense uh, for NVIDIA because I do think NVIDIA is going to run into an issue on laptop if uh, Strix, especially Strix Halo, is successful. Mm. They're, they're going to run into an issue where they there's not really a need for a low end discrete or low to mid range discrete graphics market for laptops anymore. If AMD can satiate that with APUs, if their Strix point is as strong as a 3050 and Strix Halo, and, and, and therefore as strong as any potential MX or, yeah. you know, cut <clears throat> down 4050 chip, like for sure, like if they're getting towards that with the point and then the Halo versions are getting around whatever the latest 60 or 70 is from NVIDIA. Yeah, so I mean, if if AMD keeps going down that design road for laptop APUs, then I mean, NVIDIA is going to need to figure out how to compete at that level. And obviously going to Intel and just co-developing APUs with them would make a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think if there's but, you know, I, I just still keep coming back to I cannot see AMD doing this easily anytime soon um, because they have such a good deal with TSMC. And, you know, mm-hmm. I, I guess I really haven't talked about this, I don't think, in any recent broken silicon or video. But something that's come up with a few of my contacts over the past few weeks is this idea of, like, when you look at what's going on with, you know, Sony keeping the PS5 slim on six nanometer. There's there's a million reasons why they would do that for cost, but also something to do with, you know, TSMC want is I've heard has had some trouble filling six nanometer recently, and they prob and Sony probably wants to get the best deals they can in partnership with AMD because it's all AMD stuff and Sony stuff uh, and Sony consoles. You know, so they're, they're agreeing to keep using six nanometer for this amount of time, and then you also see AMD kind of pushing through a lot of like six nanometer products right now. And continuing to promise to use them on the roadmaps for a long time. And then also like making cheaper versions of Navi 31 come to the West, as we'll get to in a second with the 7900 GRE. It kind of sounds like I'm rambling, but something I've heard multiple times from people is that there's something clearly going on with AMD helping TSMC fill their fabs. And all of that tells me they don't have any inclinations to go to other fabs that much right now. I know there's rumors Mm -hmm. about them going to Samsung for some things, but when you hear about like, Amy kind of going out of their way to make products cheaper that use extra silicon. They're trying to get on TS, stay on TSMC's best side. And as long as they're competing directly with Intel, why would they ever go there? So who does that leave really? You know, AI chips, probably extra AI chips, maybe some automotive stuff is what I would suspect. Cause I don't think anyone's worried about Intel stealing their stuff as much in that department, but I just, you know, they're going to bring up AMD and NVIDIA. I just find it, Especially unlikely AMD is going to go to Intel anytime soon. And that no. NVIDIA is probably going to be a little worried about doing that. No, I mean, I mean, I think you're generally right. It's just uh, maybe I, I think AMD manufacturing on Intel uh, is out there like in, in the future, like five plus years, because I, unless something yeah. happens with Taiwan, you know, true. It, yeah, that's always a possibility, I suppose. Then I'm but, sure they'll go jump right to Intel. <laughs> But TSMC is doing well. Um, they're slowing down a little bit, and they're starting to run into some issues, I know. But they're doing well still. A- AMD always has more than enough manufacturing on it for TSMC than what they need. So I, do- I just don't see what context they would need to go to Intel in unless 
a- a- AMD just blows up massively in the next couple of years and needs to manufacture way more. And mm-hmm. then maybe they would put something, some of their stuff on Intel or Samsung or, yeah, I mean, I guess it's that Samsung or global foundries, but. Yeah. And it is interesting, like just going back to like something you said, like them focusing so hard on the fact that they want to be a fab company that makes stuff for all their competitors on the one hand, yes, that tells me Intel is setting themselves up that, that of course, they're not going to go out of business. It, worst case scenario, if some of their upcoming product launches go badly, they will become just a fab company that competes with TSMC. But also the fact that they focus on this so much lately tells you they're really doubling down on making sure that's ready sooner rather than later, which you'd want to do no matter what, I suppose. But that tells you that they are concerned about their ability for their designs to keep up. Well, I mean, yeah, you can already see that they haven't axed their CPU design teams, but uh, well, that's I, not going to happen. But yeah, <laughs> it's not going to happen anytime soon. But if they keep failing, it could happen eventually. I mean, there's a lot more fat they can trim off the company first, I think, before they would do that. But yeah, their foundries are way more successful than their design teams for their architecture teams. So, as far as we can tell, to be fair, true, we, well, we can't we be hundred percent sure. We'll see if there's. Uh, yeah, something rotten in Denmark. <laughs> Once more Intel products start, or Intel uh, boundary products start getting out there, because who mm-hmm. knows? Maybe there is something wrong with their process as well. Um, but yeah, again, I, I don't want to suggest. I only say that to be a contrarian. Like when you see Meteor Lake not really beat, basically just rehashed AMD APUs from a year ago in efficiency. I, do, I think it's because of the architecture itself, not the foundry. But I would, if I was an investor, an investor might go, why would I be sure it's not the foundry, <laughs> you know? But, yeah. but I do think the foundries seem to be doing very well from what I hear uh, from people I talk to at Intel. They're the ones that are always the most confident lately. Um, my dog, Jesse, doesn't like it when my girlfriend's cat, Maurice, goes places he's not supposed to be. She's always out there making sure Maurice isn't getting food on top of tables or inside of cabinets even. And unfortunately, she can't be digitized yet, but for now, I don't need her to be because I have Combo Cleaner. This piece of content is brought to you by Combo Cleaner that protects your digital world against the latest malware, adware, ransomware, and spyware threats, and is easy to use and powerful so you can quickly remove dangerous files or simply useless or redundant files as well, like duplicate photos. And all of its plans include the fully featured Combo Cleaner Premium app, with daily virus definition updates so you won't need to worry about getting nickeled and dimed for the latest updates that you need to stay safe. And it's even available for Windows, Mac, Android, and iPhone. So whether you need to protect yourself from new malware, recover disk space, or remove malware that you already have, and maybe you even want premium customer support to help you do it, Combo Cleaner has you covered for all of these things, and you can get it for 80% off if you use offer code MOORSLAW80 at the link in the description. And remember that just clicking on that link in the description or scanning the QR code on screen helps the channel a lot and you're directly supporting the channel if you need a product like this and you get it for 80% off with that offer code through the link in the description. So support Moore's Law is Dead by checking out Combo Cleaner today. Mike writes in and he says, hi, with the Intel stating at IFS Direct Connect that they will be utilizing 3D hybrid bonding, backside power, ribbon FET, and second generation AMIB in their fabs, does TSMC have the same access to these technologies, plan to use them, already using them, or have their own versions in upcoming nodes? And I just I have quotes here from Carbon Cry, who helps prepare the notes now. He says, 3D hybrid bonding, that's already in production. That is what Vcash uses, people. BSPDN, plan for second gen, TSMC, 2 nanometer, and then GAFET, first gen as for N2. Also, Samsung already makes GAA chips. Intel is not the first of GAA. As for EMIB, COWOS L uses equivalent tech with a bit higher pin density ceiling. So the answer is yes. TSMC has all of these technologies. They've been Intel the punch on some of them. And the others, if they're not ready this year, they'll be ready in a year or so. You know, and when Intel says something's ready, let's, you know, it's a mixed bag of what they mean by ready, too. Um, I am Patty Case writes in and he says, so what's the deal with Intel's forests? I feel like for something that's so close to coming out, supposedly, I haven't heard a peep about it for a while. Is there going to be a 
technically it was on store shelves type launch that they don't want to market heavily? Or is it just not looking favorable compared to the competition from AMD or even more niche low power, higher core count providers like Ampere? Uh, well, when it comes to, you know, leaks, like what, what's the deal with Intel's Forest? I can't help but point out that this channel like leaked so many Rapids and Forest codenames first. In fact, I might know some that I've just been told not to say yet. And I think there's just no way around it. I've just been talking about Intel stuff less recently, especially the forests. And when it comes to the forest, that's because I don't remember if it was like 2020 or I think, I think honestly, maybe even at the end of 2019, when I first heard of Sierra Forest and was told not to talk about it for years. And it sounded really crazy to me back then, though. It was like, you know, remember, put yourself in the shoes mm -hmm. and, and, and either my or your shoes, I suppose, in 2019 <laughs> and 2020. When you have AMD launching 64 core products and Intel's on like 28 cores, and then I hear about this 500 to 1000 core product that's supposed to come out in like three to four years, uh, like I was told 500 to 1000 cores. And then, uh, you know, was that for a Sierra Force? Yeah, it was Sierra okay. Force. Their I, original I top design was 528, by the way. Uh, and that was going to be cut down to 512 cores. Mm -hmm. So even as recent as I think before they finally admitted what Sierra Forest is, I heard 528 cores, and then I was told it was axed. And so, I mean, if it's not at least a 500 cores, and it's coming out a little later than expected as usual from Intel, I just become a little more bored with it. I talk about it less, and I think anyone else is talking about it less than they expect it to as well. When you tell me there's going to be a thousand, 500 to 1,000 little cores in a product in an era where there were only 64-core processors on x86... I was like, wow, even if they're little cores, that's crazy. Then you hear 500 and you go, that's still a lot. Then you get to 2024 and it's 144 or 288 cores and AMD is already above 100 at full cores. I just don't find it that interesting anymore. And I, and, and I imagine yeah. a lot of other people don't. Um, and I don't hear any customers excited about it because if they're looking around, they're like, well, I can get Bergamo right now. That's 128 cores, 256 threads, or almost already up to the thread count of what these little cores get to uh, that aren't really out. And AMD is going to be 384 threads in a, with, by the end of the year. So who okay, cares? It's just not as interesting to me, or I think a lot of potential customers. It would have been a lot more interesting if it launched last year with 512 cores. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know what else to add to it. It's just it's another one of those things where it's just we've been talking about it for forever and it just keeps getting less and less impressive. I, and I don't know, it was announced. So it was soft announced two years ago and nothing's really happened with it. Now it's finally coming out uh, worse than what we expected. And then uh, Clearwater Forest just sounds like it's not really much of an iteration on it. Like mm -hmm. I, there's not much to talk about. Yeah. Um, all right. Mr. Tiger writes in and he says, I was reading a recent article on how Intel was the first to get ASML's new high NA extreme UV system and that they anticipate to be producing chips from that machine in late 2025. I find that effort behind Intel CEO to secure the rights to the first to get ASML's latest lithography machine somewhat desperate, though, given how badly things seem to be going for them lately. So my question is. Can Intel make up the difference just by buying the latest lithography machine before their competition, such as CSMC? Is this really a smart use of money right now? Um, I don't know that it's dumb without seeing how if they've overpaid or not. Like this is the mm -hmm. lifeblood of some of the stuff they want to make. Trying to beat, even just symbolically, beating TSMC to an actual node. And, and again, actually beating them, not being like Samsung, where you pretend you're on a node five years before you actually <laughs> are, or whatever they, whatever many years that Samsung usually pretends. But like, I, I think even just symbolically, it, it, it's worth the money probably to try mm -hmm. to even have six months where you have a node that's outperforming uh, TSMC. But I will say this, you know, I have a, a thing here from Carbon Cry who wrote in to answer your question question mr tiger that says high na has a lot of compromises and drawbacks it is not a sam dunk uh, a good example is micron versus samsung and memory samsung went to euv as soon as possible when manufacturing memory but micron continued with duv and more complex patterning and micron got huge volume and margin advantage helping them weather the downturn in dram and also micron still makes the fastest memory really with 24 gigabit mm -hmm. per second uh, with gddr6x in reality, again, Samsung pretends they have 27 gigabit per second, but they don't. Go find any product with it. Oh, they don't exist. <laughs> uh, classic Samsung. 
But so there's both that perspective there where just having that latest UV machine does not make it a silver bullet. It has never been Samsung. And additionally, I mean, I was told about Intel trying to buy the latest stuff years ago. I, and again, I haven't double checked which email, so I don't remember if I'm just remembering this, that they were. I was told they were going to buy this first. But an extreme example of this never being a silver bullet for Intel specifically is like, Alchemist was supposed to be the first six nanometer product. Like literally, they were so excited to announce Intel first to six nanometer or something before five nanometer products rolled out. And yet the 6500 XT came out first on six nanometer. And so all of this is to say, is it worth the money if it gets them there? Yes. But if Intel does get there before TSMC, it won't just be because they bought this machine. It's going to be because they got their act together. Because that's what's actually holding back Intel. Their ability to execute. Not whether or not they just bought a machine. Well, and I'd, maybe this is an uneducated, but... It, I, I mean, Intel, is, this is all under a story about Intel pushing fo- more into being a fab first company. So I don't know, having new technology for their fabs makes sense if they think they're going to be giving uh, manufacturing for a lot of uh, different partners, which hopefully they will. I mean, if they're as good at their node processes as they say they are, then I th- suspect they'll have a lot of customers because they're pretty quickly catching up to TSMC if they're not already on par with them. I'd say they're a bit behind still. But yeah, but they're not, the, they're like half a step behind though. They're not a full step. Um uh <laughs> It depends what you call a half step. Well, I I think I think they're 3 fourths of a step behind. <laughs> I'm not you're, kidding. You're, you're splitting sounds, the difference. I'm splitting that is what I would call it and I still don't think I would if you put a gun up to my head at half or full, I'd say one step behind, okay. but with the caveat that the steps aren't as big lately. So, mm-hmm. you know, you know, so with that caveat, which is a pretty huge one. All right. Now let us finally shift gears here with story number three. RX 7900 Golden Rabbit Edition launches globally. A week ago, Tech Power Up, amongst other outlets, spotted that the 7900 GRE was clearly starting to show up outside of China and far more markets than previously at the same time. Rockham 6 added support for the Golden Rabbit Edition, which would tell you AMD's planning for a lot more people to buy this and maybe use it for AI work. Then simultaneously, this channel started to get word that indeed the GRE would be globally launching on February 27th, which is pretty much here depending on where you are and exactly the hour this podcast comes out. Indeed, this channel exclusively leaked that the Golden Rabbit Edition would be launching on the 27th with limited volume and AIV support at first, but that my sources told me that this would change if sales were strong. Just expect a limited launch at first. And you see... The card is, according to my sources, being released as a release valve for excess Navi 31 stock as the generation builds towards its final year of sales leading up to RDNA 4. And then what about performance? Well, its performance really just further illustrates this point that the product is an alternative to the 7800 XT to get rid of Navi 31 yields for about the same price as making a 7800 XT. It's just 2 to 7% faster than the 7800 XT. So this doesn't really make sense as that much of a boosting in performance for its lineup. I, I really think there's even some games where the 7800 XT will beat the 7900 GRE by like 1%. So I, I really think the main reason to launch this is it's getting Rockham support. So again, they can... AI card, you know, and with those extra compute units, it might help with those AI workloads a bit more. And it's just a way for AMD to dump Navi 31, charge $50 more than Navi 32, <laughs> and it could probably cost like $20 more to make, you know? And so all of this should lead to it being the 4070 Super remaining 5 to 10% faster than the GRE for 10% more money, but of course with less VRAM. And there you go. Really the most interesting thing about the Golden Rabbit Edition, in my opinion, is that it is more efficient than the 7800 XT having a lower TDP while also having incredibly good overclocking support. I will say, again, I've heard only uh, some of the AIVs are supporting the launch in the US right now, but if you can get one that has, I don't know if there will be three APIN models, I haven't checked, but (laughs) if you can get one with unlocked power limits and push it hard, 
I've heard this kind of overclocks like GCN 1.0 cards because it's like 2.2 gigahertz at stock. Fairly arbitrarily. Yeah, I don't know. This is a, the GRE is a weird card that like I got, I understood why it released in China and not anywhere else because, well, it it, it only makes sense in a market without the other cards there. (laughs) Um, I don't think it's terrible, but at six hundred dollars, I don't know if it's quite worth uh, it. Oh, five forty nine. Oh, five forty. Well, five forty nine. Sorry, I thought it was six hundred. At five forty nine, I I should I have mean, mentioned the price in the write up. My bad, everybody. <laughs> five forty nine. <laughs> at five forty nine, I don't really think it's bad uh, against the seventy eight hundred XT, and I might choose it over the seventy eight hundred XT just for the other stuff, stuff like the overclocking potential that you said. But it is weird that it exists because it's what base. I, I mean. There's not very many apples to apples reviews for them, but just based on my back of the ma- napkin math, yeah, it's like what five percent stronger, maybe. Well, I mean, uh, and you just keep in mind, um, there are some reviews for them, like from TechSpot. There was uh, Hardware and Co. in France, I, and I, also there will be a million reviews when this drops. I've seen some of them from peers of the channel. You know, this okay. is coming out on the launch day. I'm telling you, it is like two to seven percent faster, but overclocks very well in some non-reference models. Yeah, I, I was just looking at the TechSpot review for it and adding a few percent to the 6800 XT for my 7800 XT stand-in. But and even that, it's only ten percent stronger than the sixty eight hundred XT. It, well, a little less than ten percent. But yeah, it, it's just I don't think a card between the seventy eight hundred XT and the seventy nine hundred XT is bad at, for the market. I think the gap in performance is a bit wide for just for just one uh, one step down in segments in the market, but. The 7900 GRE, I wish it was just like 5% stronger or, or, or 7% stronger. So it got stronger. to like, it, so it was, so it was like, like right for, in between the two of them, basically. And, and basically matching the 4070 Super because then it's like, well, yeah, this is like, why would you get a 4070 Super now? This is 10% cheaper, same performance, more RAM. Um, I guess worse ray tracing, but um, you know, it has 80 compute units, so it <laughs> holds up a bit better than Navi 32 in some ray tracing titles. Some, n- not that many, just you'd have to overclock it to really see that benefit. But yeah. Yeah, because where it is now, it's kind of just like a card that does, there's no real reason to get it, the, it or the 7800 XT over each other at their respective prices. So I think most people will still just keep wanting to buy the $500 7800 XT. And I guess people or 480. Don't. It's dropped to 480 That's in some true. places. So I would definitely just get a 480 that or a 550 this. But I think you got to remember this will this could drift down in price a bit. How much more does this really cost to make? It's the same boards, the same number of MCDs, the same package, everything basically. Mm-hmm. It probably costs like twenty dollars more to make. So well, yeah, because the only difference is is the uh, compute tile, right? Yeah, which. A lot of those will be the worst yields anyways, so they had to put them somewhere. So it really doesn't cost that much more to make than a 7800 XT. So as long as it's, you know, if there's a less than $50 difference, it's just dealer's choice. Which one do you want? It's not a big difference. And and I would almost wonder if what will happen is like AIB is if it does sell well, we'll start to make more of them. And then what they'll do is like the premium 7800 XTs will go away and all of the cheap ones will be 480 and the expensive ones will just be 7900. Like the volume will start shifting to that, I wonder. Yeah, because I mean, if it's a low volume product, I guess that the main market I think this serves is people that like weird graphics cards that they can screw with, which Mm -hmm. I mean, if it's just a release valve, maybe that's enough for to justify this product's existence. (laughs) Well, no, but I think it is. And I think that they are concerned with 4070 super sales picking up, although uh, Mm -hmm. 7800 XT is still selling well. But I I will say I've heard from some professional contacts and also from just some people at like micro centers and like Newegg and Amazon that I talked to that like 4070 super sales really are picking up are they picking up as much as nvidia wanted too soon to say but they are picking up quite a bit and so if you're amd you might go it costs us you know a hundred like fifty dollars less to a hundred dollars less to make this because now we can put it in these cheaper boards coolers everything with less ram save a couple mcd dies Mm -hmm. like 
if, if the 7900 XT just kind of starts withering away in the market, they can just direct a lot of those yields to making a card that maybe people actually just buy. And they're at least able to have that flexibility to save the money. Because I do think there is like, and I've always thought this, like either you want that 24 gigabyte card from AMD that they can sell for over 800, or you probably just want a good 16 gigabyte card for under, for around 500. And the 7900 XT was always, and I think it will always be in a weird no man's land. Yeah, I, I agree. So, I, I mean, I don't know. Maybe the 79. May, I'm just going to call it the GRE because I, yes. I'm tired of saying the full freaking product mm-hmm. names for everything. But yeah, I, I mean, the GRE could be a good, could serve a good spot in the market. I, I don't have anything like negative about it. I just think it's kind of funny that, I mean, it, 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 that it exists. And it's just one of those weird quirks of like that AMD has where it's like, well, when they're releasing a GRE card, you know, they have a bunch of dies that they don't know what to do with. So they're going to release an almost identical product to something that already exists or Which, in use. It's almost identical. I get that. It's not the same thing, but. Uh, which it does need to be pointed out when we first started covering this a lot. Uh, God, when was it? I want to say, I mean, it was right before it came out in China. I was directly told that they had like maybe 5,000 made. And it was literally just to get rid of some extra 7,900 XT dies that they way overproduced. Because, again, for legitimately, AMD thought at $900, people are going to lose their minds for the 20 gigabyte 7,900 XT. They didn't. And the idea of launching this in China is just to have a release valve where, like, they don't even have the customer support for it in other continents. And they don't even need to put it on a boat to ship it to America. It's coming out of the factory in Asia and staying in Asia. And here's a way to get rid of those extra 7,900 dies that we made way too many of. But now that it's going into more regions, what that tells you is they want a release valve that can get rid of way more than like 5,000 cards a quarter if, if they so choose. Yeah. And I do uh, have a question for you, though, Tom. We're not technically, I get that it was released in 2023, but we're not in the year of the Golden Rabbit anymore, Tom. We're in the year of the Wood wood Dragon. Are they going to start calling things Wood Dragon Edition? Uh, nope. Nope. <laughs> They're just going to, it's almost like this is a silly name outside of China for a limited release, and they should have just called it. Dan, it's almost like this should have been called the 7800 XT, and the 7800 XT should have been called the 7700 XT. It's almost like one that, isn't it? One could argue that. Yeah, one could argue that. And their naming scheme is completely flawed this year. But mm. I mean, this gen. Well, speaking of gens, talk about another one. Hal B writes in and he says, Hi, Tom and Dan. With your recent update on GRE B Day release felt for Navi 31, if 7900 XT sales slip, you may have overlooked something, though. Thoughts on how AMD should, could be trying to clear out existing stock before RDNA 4 launches. This move fits right into that wheelhouse. It wouldn't surprise me if AMD even started dumping Navi 31s that could pass for the XT into the GRE. I'm sure they've done that from the beginning, by the way, Hal B. Like, for sure they have. Not maybe all of them, or even half. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I was directly told they were taking what could have been a 7900 XT and arbitrarily removing four compute units, guys. That's all they're doing. And then selling it into China. Like, no, th- th- just so you know, Halby, they've been doing that the whole time. Um, and it would be easier for AMD to cut pricing on the GRE than the XT as it's cheaper to build, less RAM, slower, power TV, blah, 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 if they aren't able to sell all of them in time. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a chance they'll do that. Like, I again, mean, it's not happening now, but if it becomes popular and they believe they can keep selling it, especially if they think they could keep it profitable being sold around 500, which I've always heard that might be hard for them to do, but I don't know. Maybe they just want to get rid of stock. This gives them a product they can like price drop before RDNA 4 comes out that allows them to save it as much as possible. So it could, yes, it could also just be. It does, it's just stratifying their lineup so they have more options leading into the end of the year, I think. I mean, yeah, if because what what's the six, uh, not 60, 7900 XT selling for these days? Like, I mean, okay, so, so you can get them for 740, but like, yeah, and they, yeah, they, they, there's deals that pop up at 700 too. If it's not ever going to be a desirable product at like 700 at a profitable price point, then. 
I don't know. Admit defeat, say, sell something that's slightly weaker for way less. It's kind of just what a, uh, a, 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 AMD's version of like a super lineup where like, yeah, we have this GRE now that's slightly worse, uh, but it's a lot cheaper and we can actually make a profit on it. Mm-hmm. I, I guess that's better than just not than just only releasing those dies to their full potential for no one to buy. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, compressed earth blocks writes in does Tom, do you have an exact or a good estimate on Navi 32 sales? I know that we've seen that the 7,800 XT is selling well and we hear it from you, but does this mean it sold like a million cards, 2.5 million, 500,000 cards? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, this is a, something where every now and then in a leak, I'll put like a specific number kind of, but it's usually only around launches and that's because there's like a not going into where I get this from, there are like people who actually are tallying this and can give you an estimate of like, you know, like for example, when the 3090 launched, it was like, I mean, I think I heard it like had half the volume of the Radeon 7 at launch, which I'm sure a lot of people don't remember that, but the Radeon 7 was crazy low volume. Um, so, and for like a top tier card during a, a boom for NVIDIA to only have that many at launch, that's like beyond paper launch, for example. Um, but again, you know, that's usually when I have exact numbers and without having multiple sources, having documentation proving it, I wouldn't want to say here. All I will say is, again, I hear the 7800 XT remains a sales winner for AMD. And it, you know, if you look at like what Tech Epiphany puts out, it's backed up by that there too. So, I mean, yeah, mostly where you get that from is just talking to people and how fast the products tend to sit on shelves, right? Or well, no, there are literally some distributors who like can say okay. this manifest out of this factory is this many dies, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but that's rare. And without me having it up to the date, to, it, and then why would I tell you? I don't want to blow this person's yeah, yeah. like cover, like I, you know. Um, I think get you know whenever I leak something, it's like what's the general gist? Like what performance should you expect? How easy will it be to get? Once I answer those questions, those are the questions that help you. Me telling you an exact number. Uh, compressed earth blocks can only give away a source, right? Mm-hmm. I've already told you the advice you need. Um, all right. Now let us move on to story number four. 16 pin may be mandated for Blackwell. Well, AMD ignores it. And again, Blackwell seems to be at least launching late 2024 with the 5090. All right. Starting with a quote from TechSpot and then kind of there's some editorialization here. It looks like it could be hard to get a hold of NVIDIA's much-anticipated next-generation Blackwell-based GPU products when they do arrive. That was the message that NVIDIA CFO Colette Cress delivered to the market at the company's closely scrutinized earnings report this week. He said, We expect our next-generation products to be supply-constrained as demand far exceeds supply, Cress said another potential hiccup is the question of whether NVIDIA suppliers can keep up with the demand. NVIDIA's AI GPUs are all fabbed at TSMC, which has its own production limits. Blackwell is therefore facing a triple threat. Lovelace stock, which will be remaining when it launches. Lack of AMD competition at the high end, meaning that top end Lovelace can keep probably demanding its current pricing in some scenarios. And also strong AI demand. All press against the launch of the RTX 5000 series. And it seems increasingly likely we are going... We are looking at a quarter four 2024 paper launch for the 5090 with real availability for a full Blackwell lineup in 2025. Speaking of Blackwell, one change we know NVIDIA will keep pushing is their bombastic 12VH power connector. Quoting an NVIDIA source in a recent video from this channel, from our perspective, the 16-pin or 12VH power is the industry standard in it by now, and so I don't think it's crazy at all for us to commit to the Gen 6 version of this next generation. This saves money on bombs, and if somebody has an outdated PSU, they can just buy a dongle at Amazon. Translation, NVIDIA will keep pushing its connector more and more. Issues be damned. And so there you go. I mean, again, this is something that I feel like pops up every news episode now. More evidence, Blackwell is launching this year. More evidence, it's probably just going to be the 5090 in low volume. And I guess another thing I added on top of it last week, or was it last week or the week before? I guess by the time this comes out a week and a half ago, is that it seems like NVIDIA may mandate that 12VH power was it 12V times six plus four, whatever you want to call it, that caused some consternation on some articles that seemed to misquote what I was saying. Just like the latest version of that 12VH power connector to everything, which they do not right now. There are 8-pin 4070s. There were dual 8-pin 3090s. There is 8-pin 4060s. It sounds like with the 5000 series NVIDIA, 
may just use 12VH power for everything and even reject designs that don't use it from AIVs. Uh, if they do go full uh, through with that, I think a lot of people will be pretty annoyed. But I mean, when I asked people at NVIDIA, they said, basically, why wouldn't we do this? It's a bit confusing to me because I, I don't, I can't imagine it would save that much money per unit. I, I mean, maybe I'm just wrong. Obviously, it's using less material because there's less metal and everything. And, it, and I guess maybe one they, connector per card. And I believe like the actual PCB design is easier. Oh, I guess that makes sense. But then sense. everything else sucks for everyone because downstream. Anyone making the cables, power supplies, sucks. And we'll get to want more issues from this, uh, from friend of the channel, Igor's Labs, uh, for the next story. But but for NVIDIA, it's easier. Okay, I guess. I, I mean, I think it's stupid, and I think this cable, despite the... Well, we're going to talk about that, I guess. But despite the the fact that they think that they can push forward with it, I don't believe that this cable doesn't still have issues. Like, go on to Reddit. They, it clearly still has issues. Now, mm -hmm. it's hard to say how much of those issues are the, those cable mod adapters that were terrible because a lot of people had burned their cards with those cable mod adapters. But people still post semi-regularly a burned power, a burned uh, 4090 like on the NVIDIA subreddit. So this isn't something that just stopped in November of what, 2022? Like mm -hmm. when it first blew up, it doesn't get talked about as much, but it does still happen. Mm -hmm. Well, all right. On that note, actually, we'll come back to these reader mails I have here, but I think we should just <laughs> skip right to the next story since we're talking about burned connectors. All right. Story number five, Igor's Labs investigation calls the future of NVIDIA's 12VH power connector into question. Now, I'm summarized, uh, me and Carbon Cry together summarized and editorialized Igor's investigation to be a little shorter for this. But then I also sent the summary to Igor for approval before running it. Because <laughs> okay. me and Igor talk sometimes, people, just so you know. But so I, I this was a story that went below the radar. It is still technically within this news cycle, though. And I thought it was worth summarizing here. So recently, Igor at Igor's lab investigated the potential causes of not only many audio crackling and electrical interference issues in PCs, but also how they relate to and can be exacerbated by the utilization of NVIDIA's favorite darling, that 12VH power connector. You see, at any point along a given electrical circuit, the sum of currents going in equals the sum of currents going out. And in a PC, that means that the current provided by a connector through its power pins is equal to the current carried back through that connector's ground pins. And Igor found that in cases where NVIDIA's 12VH power connectors had melted, the ground pins were always okay, not melted. And simultaneously, the ground pins on Motherboard's EPS connectors tended to also be getting hotter than they should be. Igor then measured all currents in a PC and found that the 12VH power cables only carry back about half the current it brings in, and the rest goes back through the PCIe slot to the rest of the motherboard, eventually going back to the power supply through ground pins on other cables, which lead to the following fairly important conclusions for PC builders. First of all, PCs that are forced to conduct away so much current through the PCIe slot often expose the circuits on motherboards to noise, and actually this noise often manifests itself through crackling and noise issues inside of PC audio jacks. Random audio errors you're experiencing could be coming from this. Second, if you have a strong GPU, even if it's using an 8-pin connector, not NVIDIA's 12VH power, fill every motherboard connector you have. Even if your CPU is only pulling 65 watts, the extra ground wires plugged into those extra 8-pin ports on your motherboard help spread the load. And third, if PCI SIG decides to reduce the amount of ground pits on PCIe slots to reduce noise interfering with ever faster and thus ever more fragile PCIe signals, the 16-pin connector seems to be married to, NVIDIA is married to, will suddenly have to carry 33% more current. So that third point calls into question if there is a bright future ahead for NVIDIA's 12VH power connector. Already we are seeing lots of issues with PCIe 5.0 signaling. So what will happen with PCIe 6, which moves to PAM4 signaling that's more susceptible to noise? Who knows? PCIe SIG might eventually decide to reduce the amount of ground pins on the PCI slot to reduce the amount of noise in the motherboard, which would actually end up pushing the responsibility to carry away current to the ground pins on the connector. That already has melting issues. Does this mean that NVIDIA's 16-pin 12VH power connector is doomed? 
Well, Igor doesn't seem to be sure of that, and we hear at Moore's Law that also aren't going to pronounce it effectively dead anytime soon. But Igor's investigation does call into question if this melting connector issue will be easily behind NVIDIA with Blackwell or not, which is troubling given the recent reports that NVIDIA seems to be preparing to double down on 12VH power hard with their upcoming Blackwell generation. Oh, and uh, there needs to be far more thought put into cable quality and how PCs are holistically assembled and electrified. All right, Dan, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, it just sounds to me like the 16 pin has or 12 VH power pin, as I guess we need to say every time now, because 16 pin isn't adequate, doesn't For adequately describe In some the circles, thing, I guess. I, I, even though that's what everybody colloquially uses. Uh, it just sounds like there's more issues with this thing than uh, it, it, we even thought there were. And I'm not an electrical engineer. I understand that this summary as it's put, but I don't understand why the ground pins aren't carrying away more current than they are for the 16 pin cable itself, or it, or if it's just un- under engineered for what they say it's supposed to be, because that's what it sounds like to me. Well, it has a small safety factor. It is a 1.1 safety factor on this, and I just think it all keeps coming down to this. On paper, it works. But it is assuming everyone did their jobs perfectly with high quality cables, shielding, everything, 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 everything. No one made any mistakes. And if anyone did, there could be tons of issues, not just connectors lighting on fire. (laughs) Well, and we already know that not everybody is doing that. To go back to my uh, discussion of cable mod, there there was just a massive recall put on those adapters because clearly they are not engineered well. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So, So... Yeah, we already know it's failed, and that's why safety factors exist. Because I think I've asked this just to be for clarity, but like, so when you say a 1.1 safety factor, that means it's capable of, they say it's rated for 600 watts, but it can at Mm, max take 660. Like 660, somewhere around there. I don't think it's exactly 660, but yeah, it's around there. Yeah, that sounds very under engineered to me because based on everything I've ever heard from engineers, and it's obviously different for whatever industry you're in, where like, Civil engineers, they're like, well, let's just 3X this to be safe or whatever. <laughs> but, right. And then in automotive, I think I've heard, I heard when I was there, it's usually like 1.2 to like 1.4, you know, and that's something with razor thin margins, but has to keep, you know, but has to keep you safe. So this is below that. Yeah. And, and this is, and here's a point being made. This is a $1 on the bomb cost or something like yeah, I don't get why something so cheap wouldn't be over-engineered because it, it just should be. And that, oh, and that's what the eight pin connectors were. They were over-engineered. <laughs> and it's just so, something so cheap that I don't understand why this is what they're trying to say uh, nickel and dime on because they're, they're not going to massively increase profit margins by whatever cheap, by this slightly cheaper uh, R&D that this allows for. It, it's just stupid to me yeah well i mean and it seems unnecessary like i i talked about this in my 16 pin pcie 6.0 leak like the only reasons this really makes sense to me is if you always want to have the ability to pull a higher power level across your lineup at a moment's notice and we know nvidia almost did we've like I leaked that they had samples that were using 650 watts. I never bought into the 1,000 watt nonsense people because no one ever told me that was going to happen. But, you know, certainly EVGA even showed off a 600 watt early 4090 prototype. Um, I believe on, uh, I was, I'm trying to remember if it was Gamers Nexus or J's Two Cents. It could be even J's Two Cents, but probably both effectively. But anyways, like, so they were considering doing this with Lovelace. If you think about it, Dan, if one connector can scale all the way from, you know, 100 watts to 600 watts that means pretty last minute you can do relatively speaking do some tweaks where the overall design remains the same and push performance up 10 percent i just think nvidia is always going to want to have this ability to launch these ridiculously high-powered cards having said that though what i find bizarre about this is i feel like the safety factor could be higher because in my testing with a 4090 it was very hard for me to get that freaking thing to use more than 500 watts in a game. Overclocked, screaming at 3.1 gigahertz. I've got a 
uh, custom upgraded version of the MSI Supreme Liquid Cooled 4090. The thing was like 60 or something C, even pulling 500 watts. And yet, it was just too much heat. Like, I don't see why you can't move the safety factor a little more and just have the limit for one of these connectors be 500 watts or 550 watts because I just think 600 watts is already well beyond the amount of heat you should be pushing into a system anyways. Well, yeah, and yeah, it makes you wonder if they're going to event, if they're going to push past this with power usage to, to actually using like 500 plus watts on a system. If I mean, on a GPU, if that's going to make the melting fat issue even worse than it already is. And I mean, I'm just doing some quick math. Like you, you're saying 500 is still so much for below the safety factor that the older connectors use like to get on the level of the uh, the safety factor that the eight pin has they would have to be rated to 350 watts um which is what they should be rated for in my opinion yeah well and here's another goofy thing too like it just seems so unnecessary to me when we've had EPS 12 volt eight pins. That's the one that remember my A6000 I tested, not mine. I tested an A6000. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that had that one that I believe by itself within its safety factor could power 300 watts, so 375 watts total if you had the PCIe power. I believe is what it was. I don't remember. It may have been 350 watts. I, I don't. Da, 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 da. I'm trying to remember. Yeah, I don't. I'm trying to. Da, da, da. Yeah, because I think it can. So. Isn't that enough for basically all cards anyways, though? And we already have the standard being used by professional cards. Why do we need this other connector? It doesn't... This is already a proven standard that can basically, I think, power cards up to like 400 watts. So so why do we need more than... Okay, you'll put two of them on a 4090 Ti, I guess. Even a 4090 could almost get away with this, you know? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if that just makes this it more difficult having two 8-pin PCIe standards or... That, that's the only thing I could really think of. And no motherboard, not motherboards, right? No power supplies come with multiple EPS eight pins that I that can. They don't come with many. a 16 pin until recently as well. So that's why true. have this You've been, been any harder? And, and I right. think you could, I think they basically did come with them, but they were plugged into the motherboard slot. So you would just say, well, this one can be plugged into a graphics card. There. Done. Oh, yeah, I know. It, it's just nothing on the market has more than one of them because you don't need more than one. Well, now they come with like two or three or four because all of our motherboards need to power 500 watt Intel CPUs, remember. (laughs) But um, (laughs) but yeah, so and and also I think there's a real argument here that, you know, the safety factor on the eight pin is maybe higher than it needs to be at one point nine. And why can't they just make a new eight pin update? That's like, hey, because we already have AMD pushing out cards since about a decade ago, the 295 X2 that used two standard eight pins violated the PCIe power spec and AMD said, Oh, well, we know it's not going to (laughs) melt. And I don't see why they can't just codify some higher version. That's like use a bit higher quality components for sure. And this is now rated to 300 Watts. Cause again, 300 plus 75 Watts. That's enough to go all the way up to the 7,900 XDX. Why not? Mm. Yeah. Um, I I mean, I really don't know. I, I, I'm not an engineer, so I don't know what considerations go into any given part, any given safety factor. To me, just hearing it's higher inspires more confidence for me, though. (laughs) Uh, Bessie is ready for spring. She's excited to get outside and, well, and start carrying around entire tree branches that she just thinks are S-tier sticks, which really, they can't be that healthy for her, although... Can't imagine they're really any more unhealthy than the typical ramen people are eating on a busy workday. Well, of course, that is unless they eat Vite Ramen. This piece of content is brought to you by Vite Ramen. Vite Ramen is a healthy, tasty, and shelf-stable food crafted by an American startup that offers tons of options for eating healthy, like their classic packages that make it easy to add protein and other ingredients of your choice, or also their Ramen Go packages that offer a healthy, microwavable option for those who truly only have a 15-minute lunch break when they are away from home. And you know, I also need to take a second to promote their Nano Boost Vitality Powder as well. Seriously, this is a fantastic alternative to coffee that you'll find me drinking in many Broken Silicon episodes when I'm forced to record late at night, and I truly do believe it blows away their competition. You have to understand, I've been working with the people at Vite for years now, and I have a lot of freedom in what I can promote from their website. And 
out of the things they make, I have to say, it blows away the competition. This thing tastes great. It's easy to mix into water. You never has that sand-like texture their competitors often have. And so I really cannot recommend that enough in addition to just basically everything on their website. You know, going to their website and buying something from Bite Ramen, that directly supports this channel and it supports a sponsor that's been good to the Moore's Laws Dead team for many years. So I really do like their products, all of them, especially their ramen and Nano Boost Vitality Powder, and I can't recommend them enough. So support Moore's Law Z by supporting Vite today. Dead Eyes 117 writes in, and he says, do you expect the 5090 to be more, less, or similarly cut down from the full die compared to the 4090? With no Halo tier competitor from AMD, there's no reason for them to push a fully enabled chip to their gaming line if it can be sold for AI. So what various factors might affect the final core count we see? Are there any significant ones besides factory yields? And how do you expect it will compare? So personally, I would expect it to be less cut down than the 4090 is, but not be more full than the 3090 was. Because the 3090, I believe, was cut down by like 4% or something. 3% is, is absolutely tiny. It may have even been like 2 or 3%. Like So if I was NVIDIA, instead of having this like 11% or whatever it is for the 4090 cut down card, I would want it to feel like a Lovelace-like increase even though the node increase isn't as big as it was going from 8 to 4 nanometer or mm -hmm. 4N, so almost 4 nanometer. Um, and so, yeah, I would cut it down less, push it pretty hard, and then call it a day so that you can at least go on stage and say, this is the 5090. It is 50% faster than that card that you guys think is insane. Or And from what I've heard, it could be 60 or 70% faster. So that I would want to at least hit that. Because most people compared the 4090 to the 3090 Ti. I think it was like 65% faster, 60% faster than that. That's a car that was quite a bit cut down, not using the fastest memory. So, yeah, I think they'd want to say this is 60% faster, and so it's almost the full die. But I see no reason for them to give it the full die. Uh, and just make it command that $2,500 price point. Just make it command it. You know, like, this is so much stronger. This is what it costs. I, I mean... I really have no idea if it, I mean, because they're not going to put the full die on the 5090 because the full die oh, is they. too valuable in other markets. So, I mean, I just think it's going to be cut down as <laughs> it's almost a non-answer, I guess, but it's going to be cut down and it's going to be cut down however much they need to. So they can have a decent amount of products binned into the 5090 category. So, I mean, I think it's more of a question of what they can get away with more than what it needs to be, isn't it? Because, I mean, if this, if Blackwell just turns out to not be as well, but good, you're assuming they want to make a lot of them. What if they don't? That's true. What if they I don't mean, care if they make a lot of them? What if this is just there to take the benchmark charts, and over time they can put these aside and sell them if AMD ever competes before? I forgot what the name of the one coming after Blackwell is. I think it's out there. Uh, but yeah, yeah, and I guess we'll know. The answer to that, if they release a 5080 Ti eight months after the 5090 comes out or something. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that. Um, <laughs> on that note, though, Mike writes in and he says, Hi, with a massive 84% of NVIDIA's revenue now coming from Data Center, do you think we will start to see a change in future card releases, such as less supers and TIs? Or the potential to just use up leftover chips from current 4 series chips with some tweaks to put into the 5 series? No, I think they're just going to still sell current gen cards as current, or then it'll be last gen. They'll, I don't think they're going to rebrand. I think they've their opinion, and that's been clear for a while, is just keep selling the sixteen fifty forever, not call it the thirty twenty or something. You yeah, know what I, I mean? Yeah, and I think people are scrutinize uh, rebrands more than they used to. I, maybe even to a somewhat stupid degree, in my opinion. But I don't know why. I, I, I don't fully understand the purpose of rebranding a card to at least the DIY market. Mm. I get that OEMs want to have a new model, uh, a new lot model line every year. So they need to do what they have to do with OEMs. But I think people that build their own PCs, if they want to get a 3060, they're going to get a 3060 or something, whether, and you don't need to call it like a 4050 or 4040 now or something like that. No. And you know, even when they released, yeah, if anything, they've gone backwards, too. The cut down 3050 was called the 2050, remember? The 64-bit. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. So yeah. if anything, they're, they've, they've telegraphed they'll go backwards before they'll go forwards with rebranding and naming. So 
No, I, I don't. Um, any, I don't think they'll like rebrand four thousand series. Um, and from what I've heard, if anything, even if they wanted to use the old node, they'll just use the old node for a black hole architecture product. Um, and any, but to the actual question, you know, yeah, I think maybe like if I was Nvidia and you expect strong AI demand, I would just do like one two thousand dollar fifty ninety, a one thousand dollar fifty eighty. A seven hundred dollar fifty seventy, four hundred dollar fifty sixty, and then maybe super long term, some fifty fifty TI for three hundred or something, and that would be one, two, three, four, five cards, and maybe all of them are cut down five percent. None of them get the full dies. None of them are cut down a lot mm-hmm. though, and then w- everything else is just sold as laptop chips, AI or data center. I I don't know why they wouldn't do that next gen. Just keep it simple, stupid. If you can siphon off these into so many other things. You know? Yeah, because the only, the only reason we got that really weird line with Ampere was because of manufacturing issues. Absolutely. And because they wanted to sell to miners without admitting it. So here's a million gaming cards. Here's a million Fortnite cards. <laughs> here's a million Fortnite <laughs> boom cards that for some reason keep showing up in bulk in the countryside of China for export. It's ah. very popular. Fortnite is very popular it's, in the countryside guys, of China, Tom. Chinese gamers love Fortnite. That's why there's all these dusty 3070 M's for some reason. That, <laughs> interest, that are now desktop cards showing up in bulk. Uh, John Wick Boomstick writes him. He says, hey, Tom, I saw this article or rather video on YouTube, which discusses a couple of articles and analyst reports regarding how the AI bubble may be starting to deflate a little for NVIDIA. I thought I'd share it and maybe get your thoughts. I know you previously said that the AI bubble may not last, but what are your thoughts on it currently? So I didn't watch the video, but I did look at some summaries of it and read around, you know, this person's thoughts and kind of seems like he was saying things I've been saying, which is lead times are going down. You know, and I started reporting on this, I believe, middle of last year, late summer, or even midsummer last year. I started reporting that, you know, if you wanted an H100, they would say 12 month lead time. And then it became a six month lead time. And then it became a three month lead time. And then it was like, hey, you can get it. And for some reason, it's not being oversold on eBay for like $50,000 anymore. Now it's 30000 almost what you can get it for with a contract. I, I believe this is what this person kind of reports on. And yeah, yeah. I mean, I've been reporting on that for a while. If lead times are going down, I would assume demand is going down. And if demand is dropping and yet targets are being raised, I would suggest something odd is going on with shuffling of supply. And I Mm -hmm. happen to know some analysts may be betting on that inconsistent data soon, uh, if not already. So I don't have much else to say except for, yeah, I've heard the times are going down, you know, I mean, and yet they are racing all their targets. Yeah. Un- unless Sam Altman gets his way and he gets $7 trillion for open AI. <laughs> right, <laughs> then well, I guess, then I guess it won't go away, but yeah, I mean, that's what we've always been saying. What happened is eventually the market's going to be satisfied and there, I don't know if it's going to happen with Blackwell, but there is the potential that a uh, not AMD Nvidia is going to have a big grenade of oversupply uh, if they are not correctly calibrating for the uh, demand of AI? Mm-hmm. Um, all right, let us now move on to one more Nvidia story. Story number six: New Nvidia app released in beta. Quoting from Tom's Hardware, Nvidia slapped a fresh coat of paint on its software suite with a brand new utility called the Nvidia app that unifies the ancient Nvidia control panel and newer GeForce Experience applications. The new app will merge all of Nvidia's outgoing applications into one unified interface for easier navigation. Welcome to the 21st century, Nvidia. For years, a decade even, Nvidia has been significantly behind in their customer facing driver suite, the new app. Could be a nice step forward, but many features are still missing from utilities like Wattman, so no built-in overclocking like AMD has, and underestimated features like Radeon Chill. Still, NVIDIA seems to have no answer to that. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I have to be honest. You know, I, I actually have it pulled up next to me while we're talking here on the benchmarking station with a 4060 and the rig, and it looks pretty nice, pretty slick. Um, but I will say there are clearly... Some features missing. And I know some people have reported that. Like they have not implemented all uses that you can do in the previous menus in the new one. So they're not all there yet. And Carbon Cry, who has a 4070 Ti, I believe, also says this like, 
we're probably not going to move on our work systems, which are used for work, to this new app until it is out of beta and has every single feature implemented and it has worked for a month. Because as annoying as the old menus are, what I've been doing, I'm used to and it works. And I'd still suggest it's not really ready yet. Um, oh, and one thing I noticed messing around with it, yes, they removed the requirement to sign in, but they're kind of trying to make you sign in constantly because they're just having these like little <clears> deals <throat> of like, here's a free Call of Duty XP booster, but you have to sign in to get it. Yeah. And that pops up when you open the app. So NVIDIA is still kind of making you sign in. Yeah, I mean, I'm just looking at it right now. One of the tabs for it is, uh, because I have my it open on my laptop, one of the tabs is... Uh, the redeem and the redeem thing is literally at this point basically just an advertisement for getting free points in cod there's also a coupon code thing there but that's mainly what this exists to do uh mm-hmm. i mean which when i heard initial reporting on i think i watched the hardware unbox video about it with tim they were like well yeah but if you have to read deem a free game that comes with your graphics card you'll still need to sign in but then you can sign right out and i heard that and i was like sounds fair to me i didn't realize they were going to constantly have deals <laughs> for like xp boosters every time i switched across the menu so again it's an improvement to not have to sign in because as someone and i'm sure tim at hardware and box would relate to this who benchmarks things and then you have to sign in on like three different testing rigs it's so annoying uh, not having to do that literally does make it my life easier, but they're still pushing you to sign in. Yeah, and, and for me, as far I don't know, as far as the UI, I mean, yeah, they've modernized the UI, so it's not an eyesore to look at anymore. But that's really the extent of what they've done. It seems uh, there doesn't really seem to be any features added at this point, from what I can tell. It just doesn't suck to use as much. Um, mm-hmm. So, I, I mean, if we're always I will going say to be yeah, talking, the instant replay menu stuff and like the shadow play recording things are way better organized. It was like yeah. complete shock and blast randomness where everything was in the menu before. It is, it does look better. It's just clearly not completely streamlined in my, it still could be better laid out, I think. Yeah. And I, I think they're obviously going to, and they're probably going to reach parity with those feet driver uh, features mm-hmm. that AMD has. But uh, uh, but I'm surprised it took them this long to do it because that was the big thing AMD had over them is their software was it? I know everybody li- likes to rag on AMD drivers, but their the software was just a lot easier to use, uh, mm-hmm. and Nvidia could have answered that criticism. I mean, responded to that criticism way way earlier. I don't know why it took them so long to do it. PRTD BNME writes in and says, what do you think of NVIDIA finally releasing a modern UI for their driver software? Have they reached parity with AMD? Um, well, not until it's out of beta, you know, and they I of- still find it weird. They don't have like an answer to Radeon chill, which is so easy to use for like frame capping with a bonus. Yeah. I, I, and I assume those features will come with time and this is just, I mean, it's the beta they're, gauging how much people care uh and once it's out of beta yeah i'm sure they'll have answers to chill maybe Wattman. although it seems like they're happy Mm. just letting msi afterburner be the thing that people overclock with yeah but they didn't get updated for a few months because i believe one of the main developers was in russia and couldn't do it so i have to say Mm -hmm. that that is a real feature that is <laughs> that I think they would it would behoove them to have something. And even AMD even has self overclocking toggles that actually work pretty well. Pretty like well, just yeah. add five, ten percent without needing to do anything and insta stability test. Yeah, I mean, I think they work a lot better. Uh overclocking isn't as we're we're out of the uh pioneer day or, or the olden days of uh of overclocking where you could just push whatever you wanted. Because the cards weren't pushed as much as they, as they are now, uh, pre bed stock, yeah, yeah. Because like the, I, I mean, I've said that before. Like I, I was able to get like insane overclocks with uh, like the seventy, uh, the seventy. Well, make sure you use this special unlocked edition of tricks. Yeah, yeah. All but, those weird tricks that we used to have. But all of those things are more locked down now than they used to be. So honestly, just the ease of getting five to ten percent performance using Lotman and not using one of the unofficial or unsupported overclocking things doesn't really matter to me as much because you're just not going to be able to push a card that far anymore anyways Mm -hmm. well they're they're pre-pushed to uh, close to that level these days anyways is the better way to put it Mm -hmm. i guess what we'll say is 
This is my opinion. This is a long overdue update, but it's not out. It's not out of beta. Mm -hmm. It can't even do all the things yet that it needs to do. It still makes you open up the old menus sometimes. So it's really not ready. And so AMD has that edge in how easy it is to use their software until it is out of beta and has all of those things, yeah. right? And and even then, Watman and Chill, is that as important as DLSS? No, but it's a thing that I think people shouldn't ignore. It does let you have some check boxes over here the other doesn't have, and until this is out of beta, I don't know. Maybe then I would say it's about... Well, I, I always said NVIDIA was a little bit ahead because of some of their unique features, but I would want to see this out of beta before I go, yeah, it's clear-cutly better now. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Um, all right. Well, it's keeping the green light behind me, but on to a different company for the subject with story number seven. Xbox business updates. According from Variety, Xbox revealed plans to bring some of its exclusive titles to competitor consoles during a Thursday podcast interview with Microsoft Gaming CEO Phil Spencer and President Sarah Bond and Game Studio Chief Matt Booty. The chief game company... Uh, I'm sorry, the video game company added, by bringing these games to more players, we are not only expanding the reach and impact of those titles, but this will allow us to invest in either future versions of these games or elsewhere in a first-party portfolio. There's no fundamental change to our approach to exclusivity. So they basically announced there is. Xbox finally understood it would be preferable if it made money. <laughs> This is editorialization from Garbage right here. Xbox finally understands it would be good if it made money and not just spend it on massively overpriced boondoggle acquisitions. Current plan to release uh, is Pentiment, an indie-like side game from Obsidian, Grounded, a multiplayer Minecraft-style game from Obsidian, and Hi-Fi Rush, a rhythmic action title, and Sea of Thieves, which, which of course, released ages ago. So, yep, there you go. I mean, Xbox, I did a whole analysis video that actually was the best performing video out of this channel for a few weeks now. Um, over 80,000 views last time I checked. But so, you know, seems like the way I an an my analysis resonated with a lot of people. And I, you know, I spoke with that in depth, of course, with uh, NX Gamer when he was on. But I'm curious, mm -hmm. we've never really had a chance to speak with you, Dan. Like, what did you think of the Xbox Business Updates podcast? I mean, we've been talking forever that Microsoft needs to change their strategy. And I hope this is a sign that they're going to do this more often. And with games that don't seem to be doomed to fail uh, be, being released on the PS5, not to say that these games are terrible, but Pentiment, I don't really know. I don't think I've even heard of that game. Hi-Fi Rush, I haven't heard of that game. Grounded, I pr really disliked uh, when I played it, if I'm being honest. We played it in Alpha on Game Pass like years ago, and the game just didn't work, though, to be clear. Yeah, it, 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 it might be better by now. And Sea of Thieves is just old, but I do hear Sea of Thieves is good. So maybe that will get, or at least decent, so I, maybe that will get decent sales. But it, it's a weird four games, I feel, to put on to on PS5 to test a new strategy of putting more games on the PlayStation. But to succeed, Microsoft at some point does have to start doing this because they've painted themselves into this weird corner where their games just can't make money. Like, I don't mm -hmm. know what they were thinking. And somehow they think they're going to get, spend their way out of this by spending how much have they spent on acquisitions in the past four years? Like I mean, $90 billion. Billion, billion for Activision. Wasn't Bethesda like $7 billion or something? Yeah, I don't so, know. So they've spent like over $80 billion on acquisitions in the past few years. Well, at some point, they need to start making games with those studios that they've bought because they have 40 studios now. Um, and those studios need to actually make money, not just exist to fuel the $20 a month Game Pass, or however much it is now. Compressor Earthblocks writes in and says, Tom and Donald, Danald, Danald. I don't know why he calls you Danald for some reason. Xbox had their Xbox podcast on February 15th about the plans for Xbox. They've announced four games are coming to competing platforms. They haven't ruled out big hitters like Starfield or Indiana Jones coming out at a later date either. I would assume that they would probably do what Sony does with PC releases with big ones, if anything. Interestingly, though, they confirmed there will be more Xbox hardware, but also mentioned specifically that Xbox platforms will be the only place for Game Pass. 
So if they're not going to be, because do you think this signals they want Xbox to be the place to get Game Pass and that will be its niche in the market? It's a bit like what has been spoken about in recent broken sale kinds of die streams with yourself, Dan and Colin Moriarty, that they keep re- releasing hardware and make Game Pass that will catch to bring people to Xbox, saturating other platforms with titles when it's warranted. Was there anything, honestly, though, that surprised you about these announcements? Um... No, I, you know, basically it was pretty much top to bottom what I expected. They came out and they said they're bringing games off of, of to other platforms. They also came out and said, of course, there's going to be another Xbox. They didn't clarify what that means, but there will be more Xbox devices. You know, they say devices a lot too. Um, and, you know, that's about it. But I mean, the thing that surprises me, although I guess this doesn't really surprise me either. It's just the amount of people that are like misquoting things they said. Like they directly say things like they, they, it's couched in a way, I think, to make their hardest core fans feel better without not saying what they had to say. Like Phil Spencer comes out and goes, now don't assume anything else is going to happen. Uh, so, but then goes on to basically say they may eventually bring Indiana Jones to other platforms. Like, like saying, oh, but we have no plans necessarily now. But then later saying it could. Yeah, so it probably will. You know, and like there's all this double speak and like Yeah, I mean if you if you do zero reading between the lines, that sounds like it's we're for some reason bringing these four random games to PS5. I'm I'm very curious why it, it, honestly for me, if there's any surprises, it's the four games they brought because they just seem like it just seems like a weird choice of games to bring. Like I think the way Sony thought about bringing games to PC made more sense where it's like, let's see how popular this is. We'll bring like a few four to five year old games to PC. They sold well, and now they're putting them on PC earlier than they would have. So like maybe there's only one to two years that a PlayStation game is exclusive to the platform from now on rather than like four or five. But this is just seems like four random games, and I don't understand the thought process behind those four games. Well, Sea of Thieves makes sense because it's like an MMO, right? right? Sea of Thieves makes sense. Yeah. The other three don't make sense. Sea of Thieves is a game that I, I think has a decent fan user base. So I, I, I get that one. But Well, so that one makes sense. Pentiment is a 2022 action role-playing adventure. Huh. Made by Obsidian, though. Well, published by Obsidian. Um, yeah, I mean... I... I, I do, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I do let just look at these and wonder how much of it is these are the ones that were easiest in a diverse set of genres. And, you know, yeah. like, like Phil Spencer directly says, we're going to put these on other platforms. If we make more money, that'll be good for us. And then we're going to learn. What he's saying is, this is the polling. This is them polling. Yeah. Like these <clears throat> four different things. See if these very logical, you know, MMO. And they, if these all sell well, I mean, look, I really do think what happened is Starfield came out, did not make more people get Game Pass. And then the heads of Microsoft sat down, Phil, and they said, Phil, why don't you take a seat right over there? We just spent $70 billion buying Activision and all this other stuff, too, by the way, for other billions of dollars. We're going to make money on that. We're not just going to let you spend a hundred billion dollars total and not make back as much money as possible. That would be ridiculous to our shareholders. And so this is going to happen. And then he took that and he went, we got to find a way to break this to the fans. That's what's going on here, you know, because you can't spend $70 billion and then not have to fight even harder to maximize your profits. And that's and that's what's very interesting about all of this is the only way buying up all these studios would be a harbinger of hurting their competition, PlayStation and Nintendo, is if it instantly got everyone to sign up. And if it doesn't, what it actually does is make Microsoft force Xbox to become third party immediately yeah, because they need to make their money back. Well, and we talked about that when, uh, earlier when the acquisition of Activision was announced. How are they going to make this money back? $70 billion? How, how are they going to make that money back? Mm-hmm. Like, because that, that is uh, ignoring that they now have to finance all of these uh, studios going forward. That means they need to make $70 billion just to recoup the losses that they spent on it. And I don't know how many years it will even take for that to happen. That's so much money. Yeah. Well, the the way they do it, especially when you look at how sales for 
games are collapsing on Xbox is I think they're kind of married to Game Pass. They have to keep that going to not lose the, again, depending on how you, they call it 34 million, but like a third of those aren't even really Game Pass. That's Game Pass core, which is just Xbox gold. Um, You know, so they have to try to not lose them. So they're going to have to keep putting things on Game Pass, but then they've basically pushed all physical or, or just all full sales to Nintendo and Sony. And so they're just going to have to say, well, we're going to put it on Game Pass, make some money there. And then I guess people will just still buy it on PlayStation. And that's how we'll make our money. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> you know, I, I really don't know. I still can't, because I don't think they can put the genie back in the bottle. They can't just, would, would you agree with me? I'm trying to think of an upcoming game. I mean, Hellblade's coming soon enough, so not that. But could you see a Gears of War reboot happening? And then it isn't day one on Game Pass. Can they walk back the day one for all of their biggest games? Can they really do that? At, at a certain point, they're probably going to have to walk it back to an extent. Um, I don't know how they're going to break that to the people that think Game Pass is the God's gift to man, but I, I don't see how they remain viable if they do that with a giant sector of the market being PC and a, a s- still pretty big sector being X, uh, X- Xbox consoles. They they need to make money off of that more than the what is it hundred twenty two hundred forty bucks or something or whatever it is a year to get Game Pass. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I I think right now they're kind of testing the waters and trying to see because it's interesting. I think I heard this on Sacred Symbols, like the recent Persona game was on Game Pass, but then set sales records on PlayStation and I think Nintendo and other places as well. And you just go, I don't know. Maybe some of these studios are like. The damage is done. People don't want to buy games on Xbox. So we just have to put them on the other. And then I guess we'll just also let them pay us to put it on Game Pass. But when you see stuff like that, you almost wonder if they're like, no, we have to make it day one on Xbox uh, Game Pass. But we also have to have our exclusives on everything else. because That's actually where we'll make money. It's still just a very chicken and egg thing. And I still don't think they're quite sure where to go with this yet. Um, All righty. Let us now then move on, though, because I assume you don't have anything else to say about that, Dan. Um, to story number eight. All Jesse wants this Valentine season is for Maurice to play with her more often. But unfortunately, he just does not give out playtime or kisses for as low of a rate as she does. And I think she's just going to have to deal with that. But do you know what you don't have to deal with? Paying too much for Microsoft software if you go to cdkeyoffer.com. This piece of content is sponsored by cdkeyoffer.com. Whether it's Microsoft operating systems, office products, or even many of the latest games, cdkeyoffer.com provides PC gamers with a product this community deserves. Amongst endlessly elevating component costs, fair pricing on Microsoft keys is one thing that we at least should get, I think. And you know, the Moore's Law is Dead team has been working with cdkeyoffer.com for a very long time. And that's because they're good to me, good to Dan, good to about a dozen family members of friends of mine that have used their services. And they've been really, really good, most importantly, to the Moore's Law is Dead community. So support this channel by using offer code broken silicon to save 25% off Microsoft software or you can also use die shrink to save 3% off everything else on the website like games using either of those codes really helps the channel a ton and it helps save you money. So use those codes broken silicon and die shrink at cdkeyoffer.com today. PlayStation 5 Pro does seem to be getting some sort of bespoke DLSS competitor, and it sounds like maybe they could even force it to be used in some games without a patch. All right, so recently this channel exclusively confirmed the program for making a PlayStation handheld with AMD behind the scenes, and also the PS5 Pro is indeed coming later this year. Then, a week after that leak came out, Colin came on Broken Silicon and confirmed that he could independently verify the PS5 Pro was coming this holiday season. So that's just double verify now. And uh, two weeks after that, NX Gamer recently confirmed that the PlayStation 5 Pro is one of the people he spoke to coming out this year, but also that he has independently known that there is a DLSS competitor that Sony has been working on behind the scenes for years now. But we weren't sure how streamlined the implementation of this tech could be. We somewhat disagree. I don't know if we disagree, but NX Gamers seem to think that it would have to be something that was only handled in a patch. But after mm-hmm. I spoke with Brian Heemskirk behind the scenes, 
Uh, he thinks it was incredibly plausible that Sony could maybe force the use of this DLSS competitor without a patch as well. And he brought up these examples. First of all, right now, the Xbox already injects higher resolutions into backwards compatibility games without a patch from the developers. Second, Sony right now can force 1440p mode in games through the main menu. Now, it seemingly just, I think, downscales or upscales to look like native, but how is that really that much different than a forced version of Sony's bespoke DLSS competitor? So... With all this in mind, we already have Xbox forcing higher resolutions in games without any patch from devs, and even in games that were originally on 360, by the way. And then also Sony, in the menus of the PS5, lets you force FreeSync. It lets you force it, and it doesn't cause Mm -hmm. crashes, and you can force 1440p mode. And we already have examples of FSR 3 being built to mitigate UI issues. I don't me and Brian at least don't see why Sony might not be able to force their DLSS injection into games without any patch from devs. Maybe they would have a toggle that says it's experimental, but they do that with FreeSync right now, and there doesn't really seem to be any issues. So, again, all I can confirm right now is that the PS5 Pro is coming out this fall, or I guess holiday season, whatever that means, and also that Sony is indeed working on a DLSS competitor. And we also have all those other leaks out there saying that it seems to be a main feature of some part of the hardware in the PS5 Pro. But me and at least Brian Heemskirp seem to think that they could maybe force all of this to happen without any patches, which when you look at the fact that Bloodborne to this day is forced to work at 1080p 30, it'd be really nice if Sony could force a lot of these games to just, in an experimental mode, go to higher frame rates and upscale to a de facto higher resolution without a patch from a dev. Uh, so I was wondering what you thought about all that, Dan, because I think that'd be really interesting. I mean, it sounds cool. And from a hardware perspective, I don't know why they they couldn't do it. I mean, FSR exists on uh, RDNA 2 already. Although I don't know if this DLSS mode would, it, what you're saying is it would just be for the PS5 Pro or if it would be for... Just all- the PS5 Pro. So and possibly just like some FPGA chip inside of the okay, die so, that isn't on the PS5. Okay, because I, I could even see them implementing some type of FSR into the base PS5. But if they have dedi- if they are putting dedicated hardware potentially into the PS5 for this type of upscaling, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, they would be stupid to not have it work on at a system level, e- even if it can be more optimized by the developer if they choose to patch it. Uh, The way the PS5 currently operates, just the base PS5 already has a lot of features that you can turn on, like you said, and most games have an uncapped bench, uh, an uncapped frame rate mode at this point. So Mm -hmm. I, it it just seems like a no brainer to integrate something like this into the, from a, uh, (laughs) from a menu level uh, that you can just turn on in any game. And Yeah, if they have, like you say, an FPGA in it for upscaling. Or NPU is what one leak called it, a neural engine, whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. If they would be stupid to allow a company like, say, Rockstar, who seems very lazy with their their game (laughs) optimization, they would be stupid to not have that, uh, the, the system do the work for them instead of just, I don't know, arbitrarily cap everything at like, 14, 40, 30 on the PS5 for some reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, and I I don't remember. I think like Red Dead Redemption 2 may still be capped in frame rate on uh, Xbox as well. And it's just idiotic and odd. (laughs) I mean, it's just, it is is ridiculous, frankly, Rockstar. It's ridiculous. And like, if you're Sony, if you could do this, like make it so you can at least force higher resolutions and in some games force a higher frame rate that'd be a big deal that'd be one of those selling points for the ps5 pro where again i'm wondering if it will be 500 dollars that disc drive but it can use the same disc drive already on sale for the slim like you could just say all of your games will look better all of them all of them will look better people and the games that are patched to make full use of the pro are going to look two three times better yeah so yeah i i mean with that there if they have that integrated uh, really well on the PS5 Pro, I think it has huge potential. Without it, it the PS5 Pro is still decent, but or, or based on what I understand the PS5 Pro to be, it sounds decent still. But with that, it would be 
so way, way better. And again, just so easy to market, so easy to force every digital founders comparison to look the best. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be funny if they have like an entire team working on this feature just because they know Rockstar's not going to fucking do it or something. That would really make me laugh. But uh, the, I don't know. Still, there's a lot of, so remember, half of what we're talking about is speculation. Remember the parts that are speculation and the parts that aren't. But it is an interesting idea, I think. And it, it is getting pretty exciting to talk about, I think. Just because it's, it's always interesting to me to hear a company trying to do things in a different way that we really, it's not the usual, oh, now it's the new GDDR. It's like, this is an interesting approach mm -hmm. to raise, forcing higher performance on like a fixed system. Um, all right. Well, continuing that news with the wrap up. So again, these are these stories that we didn't think would deserve a five to 10 minute conversation, but definitely deserved mention is Sony just openly announced this is the first story here in the wrap up that they're working on bringing PSVR two support to PC. I mean, there you go. I mean, this is something we've been talking about for a long time. I even had a die shrink episode with someone working on getting it working on PC as well right now. So again, I shrink there for people's supporters for $2 a month. Shameless plug. But um, I don't know. This kind of came out of nowhere. I mean, all I'll say to that is I, I thought this was a no-brainer. I don't know why. Well, I guess it's not that late because what? It came out PSVR 2 came out what? Last year? I don't remember. A year or two ago, yeah. Yeah. It, so I guess it didn't take that long, but I, I kind of wish it would have just been there from the start uh, because I, I still haven't been convinced to buy a uh, VR, but having a PSVR so it can work on both my PS5 and my PC makes me a lot more likely to get it in the future. <laughs> and with like an OLED screen, like having it actually compete with some of the better VR devices. Yeah, I, I think I think that's long overdue when it happens, but it's it, 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 like, again, you know, I still have a Quest 2. That would be a thing. The only way I'm getting this is if I can use it on PC, <laughs> let's be honest. Right? Yeah, because I... I'm never going to buy a VR headset for just my PC or my PS5. I, th I don't think. But, but if, if you I got this now, you can play Resident Evil Eight on in VR, and you could plug it in and play Half Life Alex here. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I almost wonder if why announce it now. I wonder if they're just like if like Valve said, "Hey, we're never bringing Alex to PlayStation," and they're like, "All right, fine, fine. we'll put it on PC." Um. All right, so this also this plays into what we were just talking about here. This game, I don't know, this this I think it's technically from like a month ago. It is um, a little over a month ago, but I did stumble into Red Dead Redemption Two, a hacked PS5 running it uh, at sixty frames per second. I just I think in four K actually too. I just think this is worth pointing out because this flies in the face of so many things out there. So number one, right now, if Rockstar wanted to, they could patch the Series X and the PS5 to run 4K60 with Red Dead Redemption 2, which is ridiculous. They haven't, number one. Number two, it showed that this game that everyone said the Zen 2 CPU couldn't run it at 60 hertz. Yeah, it can. They proved it's hardware. It's basically a locked 4K60, but the minor dips in like three frames or down or so go away when running 1080p mode on this hacked PS5, proving that Zen 2 can run even one of these games easily at 60 frames per second i've seen so many people on ps5 pro say that or say that the playstation 5 and series x won't be able to run gta 5 above 30 frames i'm like yes they will yes they I, will I, if it I, doesn't i'm sorry gta 6 if they don't it is because rockstar chose to run it at 60 frames there is no way they couldn't at least have an unlocked frame rate mode yes there might be dips but i just do not believe you there's no only they're not bethesda guys <laughs> It's graphics I mean, I, bottlenecks, not CPU at 30 frames. Sense 2 is still well above what a lot of PCs people use are. I mean, yeah, I don't even understand the argument. Like, the 3700X is pretty capable of pushing 60 hertz plus hertz, uh, according to the benchmark, benchmarks I'm looking at. So I, I don't get where this notion comes from. That no, I don't too. think the PS5 could run every game at 120 hertz. With no, the, I, I agree. Sure, but 60, I, yes, I think it, it, a dip to 55 every now and then, maybe, but it can. Zen, yes, Zen 2 is perfectly capable <laughs> of running. Even Flight Simulator crazy. can run it well above 30 hertz on Zen 2. And that's a game that like milts CPU, so no. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Also, moving on here, um, I, uh, I actually, I guess I'll go through this one first since we're kind of on a console talk here. But uh, I just thought it was interesting they put the Dune map in Flight Simulator. 
Speaking of Flight Simulator, I just thought that was cool. Yeah, that's I don't have fun. a real discussion, but that's fun. Um, also, a Lunar Lake leak here seems to confirm the many, many, many rumors out there, including from this channel, that both Arrow Lake and Lunar Lake do not have hyperthreading. A leak and with Windows Task Manager seems to show that, indeed, the four big cores on Lunar Lake do not have it. So I think we can just say it now. Lion Cove does not have hyper-threading. You know, yeah. of course, we've already said that, but further evidence of that. Um, additionally, all right, this was going to be a main story until, like, all this other stuff dropped that gave, made us actually have more than six stories. We usually just have six people. Uh, the 3056 gigabyte was reviewed, Dan. Dan, what do you think of the 3056 gigabyte? Uh, it's confusing and shouldn't be called a 3056 gigabyte. It should be called a 3040 or something, but I don't know. I guess at $180, it's not awful. It's 160. I think it is 170. Well, uh, on tech power ups review, they say it's a hundred. Well, the model they're reviewing. Oh, you're right. You're right. So $160. I don't know. It's fine. I guess I would buy, probably buy it over the 6,500 XT. Uh, it has more RAM and it's a bit more powerful, but well, okay. But I do want to say this though. Um, would you buy it over a eight gigabyte 6,500 XT that costs less? Uh, and this is know. where I get into something. Everyone seems to keep missing. This doesn't only have a 96 bit bus. So lower than a normal 3050. It also has CUDA cores disabled. Yeah, People, I know. Right, so that means it's actually closer to the perfor- it loses to a sixteen sixty Ti. It's around a five eighty. I, I also do. So think- that means it's not stronger than the cheaper sixty five hundred XT eight gigabyte. I mean, I, I do think. Well, I, I do think though it's we're in the territory of the market territory where I just would recommend not buying any of these. Cars. Oh, oh no, I agree, but, but I, I just want to say that because I've seen a lot of people in the comments say, "Well, yeah." but it's way better than a 6500 XT that's too weak. And it's like, no, but the 8 gigabyte 6500 XT is actually the same performance, if not stronger, for less money. So again, I think that just is just another feather in the, this is a dumb product cap, is all. And there is probably no reason to buy it in general, unless, again, you're someone that wants to power three displays and use CUDA with 6 gigabytes. But it's like, okay, well, you know. But yeah, do you I even mean, need this then? <laughs> it's a sub $200 card, but it's also not even a 1660 ti which i also would probably just roundly tell you not to get and save money to get a 6600 because 6600 is the entry point in the in the market but yeah i I guess i agree to be clear all these cards don't make sense but this card doesn't even make sense at its current price compared to the other things out there it's just i don't know it's people get sending cards to the market to tell you that $100, I mean, sub $200 cards still exist, I guess, but. Well, I guess I, I think this needs to be 120 at 120 it, there's a point, but even then it's like, I just get a 66. It could be a hundred dollars. I probably say just get a 6,600. <laughs> um, all right, let us move on. Uh, you added this one here. U.S. government awards $1.5 billion to global foundries. I don't know if you had much to say about this, but no, I guess this just is a big notable. investment and it's, uh, I believe it's the biggest one so far, uh, hmm. the biggest award they've granted so far. So it's a big deal. Yeah, people keep forgetting that there is Global Foundries and they have fabs in the United States as well. Um, all right, and final story of the wrap up: Hawk Point at ten watts shows a large improvement over Phoenix. Now, I think this is an interesting point here because it does show that at the extremes actually Hawkpoint has some pretty large not large but notable gains over Phoenix because everyone has to remember that Van Gogh in the Steam Deck and the Z1 Extreme in the Asus ROG Ally were specifically tailored in voltage curves in binning to be actually quite a bit more efficient at 10 to 15 watts than what you would get out of a standard Phoenix. And so it's interesting to me, the 8840U, which is Hawkpoint, which isn't the specially tuned variant, 
seems to exceed all of these at 10 watts by sometimes 10% or more. I just think that's interesting because it does make you wonder what a handheld tuned version of Hawk Point would do. Would it be 20, 30% better? And if in extreme scenarios, because I imagine honestly when this podcast is coming out, we're going to have a lot more Hawk Point stuff start to drop over the beginning of March. And I think this is just a primer of like, Hawk Point's not much better than Phoenix, but it does seem like you can find scenarios where it might be 10% better. I mean, I, I don't know if there's currently any plans for... Or I can't remember if there's currently any plans for Hawk Point to go or yeah, well for Hawk Point to go into one of these mobile uh, systems or not. But yeah, I mean, it sounds like if Asus is going to do a yearly or bot sem- to every other yearly update to uh, their mobile thing, it might make sense to do that with Hawk Point. But <laughs> mm-hmm. it, although it's going to be barely, I don't think it will be significantly better but it might be i don't know like you say if it's tuned for mobile it might could be like 15 percent better uh than why can't i remember the phoenix phoenix yeah it could be like 15 percent better than phoenix Smalos writes in and he says hey tom and dan i'm looking for a new laptop and i've been having a hard time deciding here's my primary use case something to mainly use while traveling or doing light work in bed mostly internet-based, browsing, maybe some light local apps. And then also, I wanted to be able to do some gaming on the go. Only reason I wouldn't choose an M-series Mac is because I do want to be able to do that. Given this is mainly a laptop and not a desktop replacement, I am favoring portability, leaning more towards 14-inch and maybe 16-inch, if it was truly thin and bezel-lessness enough. My question is, can you summarize what is around the corner for laptops for the next 6 to 12 months? I know we'll likely get Strix, perhaps the 50 series from NVIDIA, but I'm primarily interested in how these would affect battery life. I do think what we have today does perform well for my needs, but if next gen will increase battery life by over 20%, then I may be more inclined to wait or get a rather inexpensive holdover. Anything else I am overlooking? Um, So Blackwell isn't coming to mobile until quarter one of next year. So let's just keep that in mind. And I've heard Blackwell is crazy efficient in laptops. So if you want, you know... You're gaming on the go in a 14-inch thin and light. Blackwell is going to be the best product to do it, probably. But it's going to be expensive. <laughs> so just also keep that in mind. Um, besides that, the Hawk Point is launching now. We Last story of the wrap-up is that it's basically 10% or so-ish more efficient and therefore is more efficient than Meteor Lake. By the way, the handheld versions of Meteor Lake and the like MSI Claw, they're garbage apparently like losing to basically everything, even when Braun handhelds. So no, you don't want to consider that. And because Lunar Lake's not coming out until the earliest late quarter three next year, which I'll get to that in a video. It's, it's very complicated what Intel's prioritizing here, but you know, so that's not really coming out and I wouldn't bet on it. It might not be ready just like Meteor Lake, who knows until the very end of that year, Air Lake's not going to be ready from what I'm hearing basically until the beginning of 2025 for laptop. Yes, maybe they'll paper launch it, but no. It'd be like Meteor Lake where it really wasn't ready until 24. So all that is to say, Hot Point is launching now. It might be worth waiting a month because I think a lot of customers are effortlessly and smoothly transitioning from Phoenix to Hot Point. So I'd, I'd maybe wait a month for that. Outside of that, though, Strix is probably... I mean, look, it's, it's going to come out for back to school, but... You know, will it be in every laptop for back to school? I think I'll get a lot of adoption, but that means you're either going to wait a month or you're going to have to wait eight months. I don't know how much time you have, you know? And so if you don't need it now, I would wait for Strix. And then after that, I think Strix is mostly just going to be better. Like more cores, faster cores, integrated graphics is going to be a huge deal. It will be more efficient than Hawk Point, but I think Zen 6 is going to be the mobile dominator or Strix Halo will. So you're either waiting a month for Hawk Point to be available, is my point. You're waiting till back to school to have better performance options in only APU designs with Strix. Or you're probably waiting until the middle of 2025 or later for like wide adoption of Strix Halo. I could be wrong. Maybe it's widely available in quarter one. We'll see. Of Strix Halo. And then I think Zen 6 is going to be the efficiency monster from AMD. That's not to say Strix won't be more efficient because now they have a 3050 integrated in it, but you know, if, you know, all of these will be more efficient, but like, yeah, like more efficient now, then or then. I think I've done a decent recap there. But I, I mean, I also do think, though, the only thing that the, the thing that's going to 
make battery life increases if you can start putting bigger batteries into these laptops more often and battery technology takes off more than anything because you're saying well with strix halo you can because you don't need a graphics card in there anymore that's true uh but with with when you say efficiency the thing is efficiency mostly means performance gains in laptops these days because they've pretty much settled they've in a lot of ways settled into a at least range of power usage uh for different applications so i would bet that a i mean you'll depending on the efficiency of the architecture from year to year you'll, you'll see slight gains in battery life sometimes but i also think they just want to have like a 25 to like 40 watt uh binning of, of cer- for certain laptops and those are always going to use that amount of uh, energy yeah i guess i will say too i kind of overlooked this uh mentioning like lunar lake is the one that's aiming it, it depends if like i don't think it'll be cheap at first but i think lunar lake's the one that's aiming to bring basically mm-hmm. everyone keeps talking about how like they wish there was an apu with six cores and like 30 60 performance we don't need eight cores with 30 60 performance we yeah. don't like that's kind of what lunar lake is aiming to do i think lunar lake is oh, i had a chart i looked at i think lunar lake is going to be quite a bit stronger than the integrated graphics intel has now will it be better than strix hard to say but i think it at least will be in the same ballpark while aiming to consume 15 watts instead of 45 now the cpu will be a lot weaker you know mm-hmm. you're going to have eight cores total but in single threaded, probably comparable. So I guess I will say if you're looking for ultimate portability, Lunar Lake at the end of this year is kind of aiming to bring Strix with less cores performance from 45 to 15 watts. So I guess I'll also put that on your timeline as well. Really, all of this is to say is there's going to be Hawk Point now, and then six to eight months later, there's going to be Strix than Lunar Lake. And Basically, at the end of this year, there's going to be every three months some new big laptop innovation. I think until Zen Six, mm-hmm. like it's that's it's happening half a year later than we expected as usual. But there's going to be a lot to look forward to. So I, again, I'd say either get hot point now or wait till back to school. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, let's see here. Techno writes in and he says in mid to late 2016. For $1,500, the best for gaming you could do seems to have been the following. 6700K for 10. Uh, no, I got a 6700K for $300 um, in 20, mid to late 2016. RAM was $100 for 16 gigabytes. That sounds about right. I think it was more like 80. Okay. So I'm going to do 120. 1070 was 450 by mid six. Oh, yeah, it was 450 easily in 2016 when it came out. Maybe it was usually actually over 500. And the 1080 was usually seven to 800. Uh, one terabyte SS HDD, 50 bucks. PCU, I'm not going to touch any of that. The power supplies were more expensive back then. This is in 2024. So I'm going to say he said it was $1,500 total for this build. Um, I'm going to remove from that, though. Um, I'm going to say actually with the extra money saved, you could have almost had a 1080 for $1,500. Let's just call it that because I actually disagree with some of it. But then he goes, in 2024, you can get the following for less than 1500 once inflation is accounted for. 7700X, MSI, B650P, 32 gigabytes of DDR5 and a combo, and all of that. So do you think we will continue to see this trend happen where GPU trends go up in price but CPUs trend down? Why do you think people recall the Pascal and Skylake era so fondly, even though when accounting in relative terms, it doesn't seem that different from now? Well, those are two very different questions. Do I think GPUs will trend up, but CPUs down? Kind of, yeah, actually. Do you, Dan? Um, I mean, eight cores is going to get cheaper over time. So if that's what he means, yes. But And I guess if the more we stay stagnant on 16 cores... Stagnant. St- stagnant, yeah. Uh, well, I should say, the, if 16 cores or... I, I guess I'll just say 30 to 4, because with... Um, Arrow Lake is supposedly going to be what forty threads, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, Arrow Lake two point so that's not till twenty twenty five. Okay, so uh, for the next couple of years, then thirty two threads is going to be about the max that you see. Um, so I mean, maybe a, another generation of thirty two threads is going to be cheap is going to be cheaper than what it is now. But 
I mean, you see eight cores, which is what gamers generally want to get most of the time. That's probably going to keep going down. But I think they're going to have CPUs get more expensive by adding more cores eventually. Or mm-hmm. or at least stay at the same camp they're at by adding more cores. Whereas uh, high-end GPUs, I do think, will continue to go up in price. I think they will for another generation. But after that, I don't know if anybody's going to buy a $3,000 fit uh, 6090 or something. Well... I, I agree with you on that. I think we're seeing the limits in what sells. I think the limit is about two thousand dollars. If you can't make an enthusiast chip for two grand or less, people just aren't going to buy it in high numbers. Yes, there was Volta. Yes, there was Titan RTX, but those weren't mass produced the way the forty ninety was. Um, and I also think we have to consider like, well, high end GPU costs are going up a lot because people are using them for AI stuff. I think in three years, I don't know. We might be using more purpose-built things for AI. Could be wrong, but I would also suggest that long-term that might happen as well to some greater extent. So do I think GPUs will continue to go up in price relative to CPUs? Kind of in the short term, but I do have to say that I do think they will hit a limit, and I think there's a wild card and we don't know if like some super NP will be in Zen six or seven that makes the CPU more important to your system again. And then they'll charge for it. It's hard to say like, cause it could go either direction into the GPU, into the CPU. It depends how devs use it. But generally speaking, I think very short term, my opinion, techno, I agree a little, but long term, I kind of think we're actually close to where things are going to stabilize and price at each tier. I think we're kind of getting there. Again, unless there's runaway inflation again or something. Yeah, and I, I mean, yeah, that, I basically agree with what you said because I, I I see his point that you can still build a $1,500 gaming computer and it's honestly pretty similar tier in, or maybe even slightly higher tier in performance now if you find the right deal. But I do think it's important to note that it's he is if you find the right deal. And uh, the other thing I would say about his hypothetical here is he's factoring in a combo deal for a motherboard uh mm. cpu and g and uh, not gpu and ram for 370 dollars, and all of those are a la carte in his hypothetical where those deals have always existed to some extent now i i agree like um zen 4 has been crazy with those deals but yeah i i do think the pc that he's the hypothetical PC that he's building from the year 2016 is closer to maybe $1,300 than what he's... Right, and that's why I said it'd really have a 1080 if it was 1500 And at that point, you're kind of in line. It's not better or, you know, it might be slightly better back then for the time, actually. I do, I do think, though, the baseline for getting a PC that's functional is a bit higher these days. It is. Well, yeah, because what he's, what he's not missing is if you would have just gone down to a lot of cheaper versions of all that stuff back then, you could have a $600 PC that blows away the consoles. Um, well in 2016 or yeah, or at least is comparable. Whereas now it, we're getting there because of how cheap some of these like 7600 XT is now 330. I'd say that's about equal to a PS5. You know, like all that's happening, but it still feels like the 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 lower mid-range baseline is more like a $1000 PC now, whereas before it was more like 6 or 700. Even adjusting for inflation, it feels like things are 10-20% more expensive. Now granted, 10-20% if you account for everything. Not twice as expensive like some people act, but it still is more. Also, I'd say PCs work Way better than they used to, though, to be fair. Yeah, it's because I would say like back in the day, like when I was first early early on at a PC building, so like 2012 to 2014, you if you were really pushing it, you could build a decent gaming system, or I, I should say decent for the time, because by today's standards, they all kind of suck. But decent for the time, um, you could get in for $700 probably, but you... The the sweet spot for buying a PC back then, I would have said, was somewhere between nine hundred and like sixteen hundred. Uh, and now I think it's close. The sweet spot is probably like twelve hundred to two thousand or something. And if you're trying to push it, you can build something for eight hundred. But I don't think it's that easy to go below eight hundred and still have a good system. You can go below eight hundred, but you're going to be cutting a lot of corners at a certain point. 
Yeah, 800, you can comfortably get the 7600 XT, 16 gigabyte. You can comfortably get a good eight core and mother, maybe even just six core. Yeah, I agree. I think it's like 800 now before it was like more 600 ish or something. And yeah, I think I agree. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Dead Eyes 117 writes in. He said, at a basic level, computers are just machines that do math really fast. I'm just curious how fast, but I don't have enough good understanding of the inner workings to estimate myself. How long do you think it would take a human to solve a single frame? From a modern video game by hand, aside from a lifespan, would there be any other reasons why this would be impossible? I'm just going to read the answer Carbon Cry wrote. If a game is run at 60 frames per second using a GT1030, it took at most 18 million multiply account accumulations. I don't know why I couldn't say that word. Uh, 18 million multiply accumulations. So let's say just a quarter of a max teraflop. Uh, so 4.5 million. Reportedly, the fastest human calculator takes 20 seconds to do a single multiplication. So multiply that by 4.5 million. <laughs> um, and I would say the other way is this isn't solving it, but imagine an artist is doing a dot painting or something. Sure. For 4K, that's 8 million dots that the artist has to draw. And then they, there's all the background work that would go into having to plan out what dot goes where to build a single frame on a TV. So, eh. either way you look at it, the answer is a very long time. I don't know how long exactly, but it's a very Doing long the time. Math. <laughs> 25,000 hours. My math, if I'm understanding what Carbon Christ said correctly, is under a, th a little under three years. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. That's what it would take. And with that goofy sign off reader mail, that actually does it for this episode. Dan, any final thoughts? No, I don't. Why think do so. I always ask you that? It's like at the very end, and it's like, what would Dan say? And it's just like, you're going to launch into some well, rant I, or I, diatribe? Or I, Actually, I guess I will do this now uh -oh. because I almost included it in the wrap up, but I decided not to because there's no actual new information. But I did stumble across an article while doing research uh, about the Snapdragon Elite X, uh, another Geekbench leaked. And that's why I didn't include it, because the Geekbench is already leaked for that. And I just found the phrasing really strange, where it says it beats AMD's top-end APU, and it beats the HS in single-thread and multi-threaded, but not the HX. And... They didn't disclose how much power it was using in the benchmark. So I just find it a so bit So was strange. it compared to Phoenix or Hawkpoint? Uh, it was Phoenix. Oh, then how much did it beat it by? Uh, it was like 11,000 versus... It was 11,000 something versus 12,000 or something. And it so was, it's like even with Hawkpoint? Yeah. And it was for a synthetic benchmark, and they didn't tell you how much power it used. I don't know. I just found it strange. It's like... Some websites really want the uh, really want to build the elite the Snapdragon Elite X story like it's going to uh, the, like it's really going to change the industry when it's like this is very much in line with what currently exists. <laughs> and yeah, I don't know. Until I see non synthetic benchmarks, I don't know why anybody talks about the Snapdragon. Although I'm mid twenty twenty four, so it's it's like barely before Strix. It's not competing with Hogpoint. Yeah, I know. And, uh, and I guess I, it's, I'm talking about the Snapdragon CPU right now and my criticism about how much we talk about the Snapdragon. But show me a non-synthetic benchmark and show me that it actually can emulate x86 uh, Run correctly. Windows and run my games well yeah. off Steam. <laughs> yeah. Which, if it can, I'll get that this year. I, hey. I, I, I'm not saying I don't want the Snapdragon Elite X to uh, make new numbers and put intel and in but you're AMD saying the way shame. it's phrased they're like puts amd's top apu to shame it's like that was their last year one that was and this is launching one, next to strix not that was their last year one and they're comparing it to the low power version of it <laughs> yeah i don't know dan there's just this way people there are just some stuff that some websites pick to hype up more than other things whether it makes sense or not yeah i know and that's why i didn't include it as a story but now i'm ranting about it at the end of the episode for no reason so they got that sweet press they wanted, Dan. <laughs> um, well, all right. If you want to go and support a channel that claims to not want to hype up stories we don't like, but then does it anyways, remember, <laughs> subscribe to Moore's Law is Dead on YouTube and ring the bell button. 
you know, like the video, share this video or podcast, you know, go on to your podcast app of choice and download it there as well. You know, there's limited ads in that version. The audio quality compared to YouTube is very good. The, subscribe to the Moore's Laws Dead. Uh, the, subscribe to Broken Silicon on the podcast app as well. And give us a review. It really does help people find us in those avenues too. And of course, consider supporting us on Patreon. Just $2 a month will get you access to Die Shrinks. A new one just came out. Looking at a lot of crazy hypothetical scenarios for hardware competition over the next few years with AMD, NVIDIA, Intel. We even have a couple questions about Xbox and PlayStation and I think the Switch 2 in there as well. Just $2 a month gets you access to multiple ad-free hour-long videos going into in-depth stuff. And all this, there's ad-free versions of Broken Silicon that come out early. You can ask us questions. Um, all this stuff, I think the next guest is going to be Vex. We'll be talking about all the recent releases that have happened so far this year. Be able to ask some questions, support us on Patreon. Um, but uh, to everybody else, no matter what, though, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. And as always, have a good week, everybody. Goodbye. This podcast was brought to you by the YouTube channel and website Moore's Law is Dead. Moore's Law is Dead and Broken Silicon are trademarks of their creator, Tom. That guy is me, and I am indeed the creator, editor, writer, and showrunner of Moore's Laws Dead podcast, videos, articles, and other media. However, it's not just me. Moore's Laws Dead is a team with Broken Silicon co-hosted by my brother Dan, audio editing by Gerard Cortez, renders being done by the industrial designer Jean-Philippe Clermont, and special assistance is also provided by Carmen Cry and Carrie Nosugad as well. Find all of our information at www.moreslawsdead.com on the about slash support page in the event you do want to hire me for consulting work, hire Gerard for audio work, hire Jean-Philippe for industrial design work, or you're interested in working with Carbon Cry or Kerry No Sugata as well. You can also find our long-term sponsors on that page if you want to show them some love for putting food on our tables. Or you can also mail us some love. You can send letters or hardware donations to the following address. Moore's Law is Dead, P.O. Box 60632 in Nashville, Tennessee, zip code 37206. Although, to be honest, the best way to show Moore's Law is Dead some love is to support us on Patreon. Patrons are what makes Moore's Law is Dead content truly possible. Every month, and really every day, depending on who you're talking about, me, Gerard, Dan, and John Philippe are working tirelessly to provide a steady stream of content that we could not keep doing unless we knew the work was possible without being reliant on sponsors dictating every little thing we put out. Don't get us wrong. We love our sponsors, but we love directly working for you, our fans, much more. If you have any extra money, even a couple free dollars a month, consider supporting us directly on Patreon. Those couple of monthly dollars will get you access to the exclusive podcast Die Shrink, voting on subjects of future podcast episodes, the ability to ask guests questions, and of course, access to the Moore's Laws Dead Discord full of like-minded people who I am sure would love to meet you. I am one of them. Additionally, higher tiers get access to early, ad-free episodes of Broken Silicon, the ability to ask questions in all Broken Silicon episodes and loose ends live streams ahead of the recording, and the entire back catalog of Moore's Law is Dead podcasts, in addition to having thanks in the credits of videos and podcasts depending on the tier with other perks available as well. And hey... If you cannot afford to support us directly every month, please do share Moore's Law is Dead videos and podcasts with friends and family and on social media and websites like Reddit. And give Broken Silicon a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or your preferred podcast app of choice. All of this does really help us so much. But like I said, this podcast would not be possible without it, the patrons directly providing predictable and reliable support every month. And so now it is time to give a personal thanks to the greatest of the fans. The following supporters are at the 10 gigahertz or higher supported levels. Brad Medlin, Drita Folsey, Jits, Daniel D, Aaron Close, Jen Rauner, Daniel High, Jeezy Ziggy, Brian Riggleman, MJB1, Deke, Nicholas Puckner, SNS Thomas, Jeremy Ferrier, Malcolm Olev, Jensen Wang, Hardforum.com, Gregory S. Acker, Andrew S. Sarcastro, Evan Dingle, Chris Rich, Compressed Earthflux, 3DS Boy 08, Hal Buma, Greg Wanchuk, Shredberg, Dr. Foreman, Benjamin Cannon, Jonathan, Holden Mobley, Blake, Franco Frederick, Sammy Malas, Jake Dude 23, Jake Martin, Jordan Simkovic, Slicky, Dooley Leak, Boss Haas, Stefan Hart, Meat and Pork, Tim Robb, Ian Clifford, Travis Gooding, 
Stefan, Toka, Mads, Sutsu Taylor, Stephen Coates, Michael McGee, Greg, Patrick Crow, Amiable Chief, Chrysantine, Tommy, Mark Mitchell, Aisha, Mark Rainmaker, The Eternal Dreamers, James Anderson, Cole Attic, Judson N, Neithrid Sink, Cameron, Wissy Sazer, Henry Shang, Michelle Pell, D31337, Antics, Hexa Puma, Reginald Ari, Teak Autumn, Gaiman Since Reagan, Jeff Settler, Loophole 35, JSMMH, Windstar, James I, Raider, Corey Leonard, Little Germany, Shay, Milton, Pulse Media, James Witters, Dave Schultz, Melodic Warrior, Mac Daffy, Stephen Dick, Chuck Glennon, Brett Jones, Austin Haggerty, Justin Bustle, I-711700K, Joe Foot, Hardland, Lars Torres, Slushbot, Jansen Angima, Joseph Kelly, Samuel Park, Hemsa, Gung, Tails, 2299, Miel Valvera, John, Sisyphos, Dale Russell, The Forbidden Juice, Per Leakman, Win Wang, RB Racer, AC, Michael Cozy, Dr. J Matt, Alex Vega, Free D, Brian Wright, John Swin, Angel of Cake, Jola Martina, Kikum, Elbergun, Solarized 80, Matthew Marlowe, Raisin Biscuit, Jeff Johnson, Penta Winter, Rowan McKicky, Cornster671, Sprutnik, Jeffrey Jenneman, and of course, thank you to Sahara for the music.